Equity Volity picks up in what could be the last real liquid trading week of the year. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic, and look who's back. I'm back, yeah. and I'm Katie Greifeld. We are kicking off to the closing bell here go. in the U.S., and uh, we do have a rally on our hands again with about two hours until those bells ring. You take a look at the S&P 500, up about three-tenths of a percent. It doesn't look like much, but those are session highs. You can see uh, that really following through in big tech, leading the way, the Nasdaq 100, up about nine-tenths of a percent. Some interesting movement in the bond market. Yields only about two basis points higher right now. We did get a pretty weak 10-year auction about one hour ago, but we had seen a big rise in yields, a sell-off into that, and uh, yields coming back a little bit right now. And as Romain mentioned, I was off for a week. So Romain, I put Bitcoin on the board because I understand it was a pretty volatile week, a pretty good week for Bitcoin. Some of that rally coming back now, though, and reversing Bitcoin down about 6.5%. Katie went away, Bitcoin went up, Katie comes back, Bitcoin comes down. Correlation, not necessarily causation, but we'll dive into that a little bit deeper into the show. A lot of individual stocks out there moving today on the back of M&A activity, believe it or not. Occidental Petroleum agreeing to acquire shale driller Crown Rock for about $11 billion. And department store Macy's said to have received a $6 billion buyout offer from Ark House and Brigade Capital. Now, the flip side of those two tie-ups, health insurer Cigna said to be walking away from negotiations to buy Humana. Apparently, they couldn't agree on a price. And a decision by mobile software company BlackBerry to abandon plans to spin off its Internet of Things business is not going to keep that unit in-house alongside its cybersecurity vision. Uh, we're going to dive into some of those stories a little bit later in the show, but we have to talk about chip stocks here. A big rally going on right, day, right now. In fact, it's the strongest sector among the groups today. This on the back of AI optimism. About 27 of the 30 members in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index in the green. That includes Broadcom, KLA, and LAM Research each at a record high. The moves helping the Sox extend a rally for a third day and propelling that index toward its highest close going back to January of 2022. And before you ask, NVIDIA is sitting this one out as investors do a little bit of profit taking for what is still the best performing stock in the SOX, the NASDAQ 100, and the S&P 500 to boot. Now, despite the activity to the upside, the next two days could be crucial for setting the next direction for the broader market. Katie Greifeld, a market, of course, that has been keen on a resilient job market, a slowdown in inflation, and dovish, dare I say dovish, central bank rhetoric? And maybe we'll hear more of it, maybe on Wednesday, or we could see the central bank lean hawkish when we finally hear from the Fed and Jerome Powell. Because you take a look at what the market is pricing, we're talking about 100 basis points of cuts next year pricing right now. That works out to about four cuts. And we've heard from the top down the central bank really pushing back against that, saying that we need to see inflation sustainably back on the path to 2%. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about what sustainably means in this context. But if we actually see this come to fruition, if we do get cuts next year, depending on what the cause is, that could be good news for some of the equity bulls out there. Of course, we are getting those year-ahead forecasts rolling in. And Oppenheimer Asset Management out with one of the most bullish calls on the street, their year-ahead target for the S&P 500 at 50 200. You take a look at where we are right now. That's uh, would be a record high close. And we have a lot of wood to chop before we get there. We know, of course, we got to focus on the corporate fundamentals, Romain, but it still feels this is very much a central bank driven market. All right. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. And who better to do, do it with than with Rebecca Patterson, former chief investment strategist over at Bridgewater Associates, joining us today to help kick us off to the close on this Monday afternoon. Rebecca, great to have you here. Good to be here. I think a lot of people are saying this could be the most consequential, or at least the last big consequential week of the year before we get to some of those lofty targets in 2024. We still have to deal with the CPI report this week and, of course, a Fed that could potentially maybe signal to the market something. Yeah, I mean, with the Fed meeting this week, I'd be looking for four main messages. I think you're going to hear optimism from the recent economic data releases that things are at least directionally on track for the soft landing. So they're going to they're going to take a little bit of victory lap on that. Mm -hmm. I think secondly, though, they are going to acknowledge financial conditions, which are going the other way. You know, they've yeah. eased quite a lot since the last Fed meeting. And so I think we're going to see a change in the statement acknowledging that. And that's something they don't want to overplay, but they want to acknowledge they're aware of it. Mm -hmm. I think third thing and probably more consequential is they're going to say any discussion of rate cuts is premature. 
the second they open that door, financial conditions are going to get significantly easier, and they don't want that to happen. So they're going to make sure, they say, don't even bring it up yet. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and I think really importantly for this meeting, we are going to get the dots, right, their yeah. forecasts. And I think they're going to continue to be a lot more hawkish than what you just mentioned, that what the market is pricing in, 100 basis points of cuts next year and then more in 2025 mm -hmm. and 26. Well, I remember the last dots we got, that, that one of the, the more uh, interesting things about it was just the dispersion in opinions out there, particularly when you go out a year or so. It just seemed like there was no consensus whatsoever. And I'm wondering if we see a little bit more of that, particularly with some of the meetings that are on deck for 2024, which is right around the corner. I think that's going to be really interesting to watch, actually. And, and when you think about the makeup of the Fed, we have the Board of Governors, of course, but then we have the regional Fed presidents. And they're going to be bringing their best foot forward in terms of what they think is best for the economy. But remember, they're also representing their districts. Yeah. And so some of that discrepancy might be their own regional model. Some of that might be a little bit what they're seeing in the region and what mm -hmm. kind of policy would make sense for the economy and their district in particular. So that could help explain some of the dispersion. And so even if we get the dispersion when it comes to the dot plot, uh, the top down message, as you mentioned, probably uh, central bank leaning against what is being priced in when it comes to rate cuts. But when it comes to financial conditions and trying to restrain them, what more can the Fed do here besides jawbone? Is that it? I don't think the Fed is overly concerned about the recent easing in financial conditions right now. It, it wants to just say, hey, we're here, we're watching it. But I wouldn't expect anything beyond that for, for any time soon. I think what the Fed is really trying to see is, are we still on track for the soft landing? And, and it, this is not an easy goal to achieve. I mean, this is Simone Biles' Olympic event soft landing sticking it here. And I think what they want to see is a consumer that's still spending, but in a slightly more moderate fashion, a labor market that's normalizing, not with layoffs, but with greater participation and fewer job openings. Those things would reduce wage inflation without people losing their jobs. That would be amazing to see. I think they'd also like to see Interestingly, China continuing to struggle a little bit. Obviously, they don't want China to struggle, but what it means is deflation being exported from China. And we're seeing that come through in our import prices, which have been in deflation all year. So that is helping the soft landing cap because it doesn't really push people out of jobs in America. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, commodities, right? Mm -hmm. Oil is down 12% so far this year. And that's something that absolutely helps the average American consumer's disposable income. So I think that's, that's like their wish list for the holidays if you will, mm -hmm. for what we could see next year. It's a question if they get everything they want, though. I'm still a little skeptical. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's a yeah I had to tell my son over the weekend he wasn't getting everything on his list. No. Did he uh, have a soft landing? Low, low, in, <laughs> low inflation was not on that list. More, It was higher consumer spending was on that list. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the risks here to uh, the Fed's wish list when it comes to a soft landing. We are expecting CPI tomorrow, expected to show that continued uh, cooling off. But when you think about what could upset the apple cart, do you think of there's any risk that we see inflation reaccelerate to the point where potentially we have to start talking about rate hikes again? Yeah, well, I mean, it could always be an exogenous shock. It could be something that pushes up commodity prices. Suddenly, we certainly had fears of that earlier this year with the crisis in the Middle East. It could be if the consumer spending, to your point, is too strong, right? If people are just whipping out those credit cards and say, I'm going to keep spending next year and take those trips, et cetera. That could be something, especially in the service sector, that keeps wage inflation high. And if wage inflation reaccelerates and or commodity prices lift inflation expectations, that's definitely something that the Fed would note and potentially, depending on the degree, act on. Yeah. And just real quickly, when you look at all the bullish wagers into 2024, does that look sound to you? Well, the, the bullish picture for 24 in terms of equities yeah. is discounting a soft landing. It's discounting a still strong consumer mm -hmm. and inflation coming down gently to the Fed's target that allows them to cut 100 basis points next year. Yeah. So if that happens, amazing. But I think the risk is that there's some disappointment. Yeah. Maybe not complete disappointment, but enough that you want to, I think, temper your expectations a bit on equities next year. All right, Rebecca, always uh, great to talk to you. And if we don't see you before the end of the year, have a wonderful holiday. Day. Rebecca Patterson, former chief investment strategist over at Bridgewater Associates, helping us kick off to the close here on a week where there's a big focus on the macro. Ellen Zentner, chief U.S. economist over at Morgan Stanley, stopping by to give us her insights on this week's big decisions.
Plus, a big day for deals, including Occidental's plan to acquire Texas shale driller Crown Rock in a deal valued at about $10.8 billion. We'll take a look at what's at stake for the sector. And an interesting study out on Eli Zilly's Zepbound. What happens when people stop taking the weight loss drug? That conversation and so much more coming up in a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Wednesday, the Fed decides. We're talking rates. We're talking inflation. Without a recession, that's the good stuff. Will officials pause as expected? We're heading into the end of the year. We're in a soft landing right now. Will they put rate cuts on the table for 2024? It remains to be seen. The data will dictate that. Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. Everything was hedged. They're going to have to have a good reason to do whatever. Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. Well, this is going to be a huge week for central bank decisions around the world, including the Fed on Wednesday. Then we get the BOE and the ECB on Thursday and China on Friday. Plus, tomorrow we're going to get the latest read on inflation in the U.S. Here to help break us break it all down is Tom Orlick. He is chief economist over at Bloomberg Economics. And let's start with the Fed. I see the House view over at Bloomberg Economics is for 125 basis points of cuts next year. And Tom, I guess my big question for you is what's going to really fuel that? Is that a recession call or is that just getting back to normal? So the view from our U.S. team, Katie, um, is that it's really a close call for the U.S. economy right now. Uh, and of course, we had some surprise strength uh, from the jobs data last week. Um, at the same time, though, um, the lagged impact of Fed tightening, all of those hikes we've had over the last period of time, the peak impact of that tightening is still to come. Um, so we think it's still too early to make that call on a soft landing. Um, and we think the balance of probabilities is actually tilted towards a shallow recession starting around now and stretching into early 2024. Um, and it's that um, which is driving our expectation of 125 basis points of cuts by the Fed next year. So it's kind of an interesting week because we're also going to hear from the, a couple other big central banks, including uh, the European Central Bank. And I'm curious whether the situation there and what Christine Lagarde has to confront is materially different than what we're dealing with here in the U.S. So it's interesting, Romain. Uh, we've got Powell, Lagarde, Bailey um, all in action this week. Um, and uh, in some respects, the challenge for each of them is pretty similar. Um, the markets across the US, the euro area and the UK uh, have moved early and aggressively to price in um, a pretty significant loosening of policy next year. Um, now, what the markets are pricing in, it's not outside the range of possibilities. Um, uh, however, if we think about the incentives for the Fed, the ECB and the Bank of England, well, the incentives for those institutions is to do everything they can to get inflation back to target. And from that perspective, they don't really want to endorse the aggressive cuts which the market are pricing in right now, because if they do that, the risk is that they spur a market rally, and that makes it that much more difficult to get inflation back to target. So our expectation for the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of England is that they go some way to endorsing market expectations, but by no means all the way. All right, uh, Tom, always great to catch up with you. Uh, Tom Orlick over at Bloomberg Economics. You're a closer look at two big central bank decisions this week, the Fed and over in Europe, the ECB, raising a lot of questions about the state of economic conditions. Back here in the U.S., the governor of the state of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, says U.S. voters are actually correct to be concerned about the risk of a recession next year. He spoke earlier in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. Let's take a listen. The most pressing issues today are ones of economic confi confidence um, and really the challenges of rising cost of living. Listen, it's just clear over the course of uh, now the last three years of the Biden economy, we have seen inflation really run away from a lot of folks. And 
60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and I hear it. I think our next year or two of national economic opportunity is going to be defined by a lot of these most important issues. One, what's happening internationally? And I think we have got more black, uh, black swan risk uh, internationally than we've seen in a long time. A war in Israel, a war in Ukraine, uh, saber rattling like we have never seen in ch with China towards Taiwan. Um, we are seeing massive, massive ch challenges with regards to national security around the border and how we handle this, this um, just abso absolute crisis and drug flow and, and illegal, illegal immigration and how, and how we're responding to the pressures that it's placing on all of our cities. And yes, we're seeing interest rates that while I believe the market is hoping For that these come down next year, um, hope is not a strategy. And in fact, there's a big difference between markets and the economy. And in this case, I think interest rates will be higher for longer. I think it has a, 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 a massive so you effect. you don't think the Fed will cut next year? I, I think that when we, we, the Fed will cut when we have a recession. <laughs> and this is the reality of a mild recession that I expect that we will see next year. We're building it into Virginia's plans. Um, and then finally, we've got a real challenge around uh, reaching a budget agreement. And while there have been um, two postponements of this real debate, uh, come January and February, we'll have it again. And I think that there's just a, a reality of there's, there's a, a lot of distance between uh, agreeing here. And so those factors uh, all suggest to me that we do have risk of a recession. I hope we don't have one. We continue in Virginia to drive things that, that, it, that are expansive in policy so that we can have more jobs. But at the end of the day, I think that uh, in Virginia, I know this, we are planning for a mild recession next year. I'm going to make sure that we're prepared. Uh, and if we don't have one, then Virginians will be a lot better off. And that is the governor of Virginia, the Republican Glenn Youngkin, speaking exclusively with Bloomberg a little bit earlier here uh, about, I guess, what he sees, uh, uh, Katie Greifeld, when it comes to recession probabilities. I did think it was interesting he said that as governor of Virginia, they're already baking that into, I guess, their budgetary plan. So I guess he is a believer. He isn't just saying this just to say it. Yeah, that caught my ear as yeah. well, because, of course, we talk about recession probabilities mm -hmm. all the time. And uh, we listen to a lot of economists. But interesting to actually hear from a politician putting plans in, pa yeah. in place for that base case. And of course, that's what voters are concerned about, you know, the possibility of a recession. Yeah. And of course, inflation, even though obviously it's cooled a lot, yeah. still a big bugaboo for a lot of people. But I think you have to separate those two as well, because I mean, the recessionary calls, I mean, at least right now, when you talk about an economy growing at 5%, and even some of the more pessimistic uh, calls in terms of what we're going to see over the next few quarters, no one is really pushing us into negative territory. Mm -hmm. Yes, growth will moderate. But we know there's a disconnect there because even if growth is still rising and we're still healthy, it's how people feel. And if people are still feeling the pinch, whether it's at the grocery store or elsewhere, then that feeds into consumer behavior. I think it's a good point that uh, if we do get a recession, and of course, we've seen a lot of people back off their recession calls, maybe it's not the typical recession we see. Maybe it's yeah. more of a rolling recession, people pulling back spending in certain areas as prices remain elevated in a lot of areas. Yeah, absolutely. A lot to talk about here, a lot to talk about coming up later in the week, and a lot to talk about today when it comes to weight loss drugs. An interesting study is out uh, around Eli Z Lilly's ZepBound uh, weight loss drug, a new study that answers, well, how much Wait, can you lose? And more importantly, what happens when you stop taking the drug? That conversation coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All the talk over the last few months that's been about weight loss drugs, the promise that they have, and of course, some of the risk around them. We're now getting more empirical data to answer those questions. Shares of Eli Lilly falling today after a new study found that people who stopped taking the company's ZepBound after about eight months regain half the weight that they lost a year later. Bloomberg's Madison Muller joining us right now with more on the story. And Madison, let's start off here. Most of the talk about all of these weight loss drugs, not just ZepBound, was this idea that once you were on it, you pretty much had to stay on it or run the risk of gaining back some of the weight that you lost. The share reaction that we're seeing today, is it because of the revelation that people gain weight back or the amount of weight that they're gaining back? Yeah, I think the share reaction is a little bit of a surprise because like you said, it's it's known at this point that if you stop taking 
GLP-1 drugs like Zepbound or like Wagovi, you patients tend to gain the weight back. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just because this is a chronic disease that requires medication um, for the rest of someone's life potentially. But mm -hmm. I think that this was, this provides concrete evidence that that is happening. Um, and actually we thought that, that the weight loss was not as, I mean, sorry, the weight regain was not as severe as we thought and that we've heard in some instances because people didn't gain all of the weight yeah. back. They, they yeah. only regained about half of it. That's what caught my attention because I know the takeaway, of course, is that, oh, you stop taking it, you gain weight back. But to get into some of the details here, after 88 weeks, a group no longer taking the drug after the first eight months had still lost 10% of their weight. That's a significant amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a significant amount. And, you know, it happened, the weight regain happened slowly. There were still some other health benefits that were maintained regardless of um, the weight regain. And so it's not, you know, it's not like it's happening overnight. It's not happening in a matter of months. And, and people are able to maintain their weight loss for the most part, um, at least, you know, some of the weight loss. And that's something that is really difficult. I mean, 10% weight loss is still a really big deal, and that's more than can be achieved typically with diet and exercise alone. Yeah, and you sort of wonder, like, if you start talking about 10, 20% layoffs, weight loss as a re retention, mm -hmm. what the potential health benefits could be exactly. that might offset that. Of course, of course, we'll need to see a lot more studies of that. I am right. curious, though, about some of the other side effects that mm -hmm. while you're on it, and I know there's been a lot of discussion, was any of that sort of raised in this particular study? Yeah, they did look at that as well. Um, and it did look like the rate of nausea and some of these GI effects was, you know, as has been seen with some of the other studies, I think the rate of nausea was somewhere in the 30% range. Um, so yeah. still significant amount of side effects happening, but, you know, it's, it's not as, it's actually not as high as we've seen in some of the other studies, which was interesting as well. But this study was specifically looking at, I mean, they, they split, they gave a group of patients the drug mm -hmm. for 36 weeks and then split them off and yeah. half the patients kept taking it and the others did not. All right, uh, Madison uh, Muller, a closer look here at some of the latest uh, data that we got on ZepBound, that's Eli Lilly's uh, entry into the weight loss market. Some breaking news crossing the wire uh, involving Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance. Uh, the shares uh, opened up higher by more than a percent, now down more than a percent after uh, Moody's uh, cutting the company's rating to junk. Uh, Moody is basically saying now that the credit rating on Walgreens Boots Alliance is now cut to junk. The outlook is stable. We're now down at BA2. Remember, they were at BAA3 prior to this, uh, Katie Greifeld here. But nevertheless, uh, for a company that we know has had some uh, financing and refinancing issues, this certainly is not going to help. Yeah, interesting uh, to see the share reaction there. It's pretty contained. You do see that spike lower, and it is coming on a day. That is an update for the overall market, so clearly yeah. uh, some bad news being digested there. Yeah, uh, two notches uh, is the downgrade lower, and we should point out Moody specifically citing the company's high financial leverage. A lot more coming up here on The Close. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, just about uh, 2.30 here uh, in New York, keeping an eye on what's going on in the uh, cross-asset markets. Let's get right to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our commodities close. Abigail. Yeah, well, remaining, Katie, we do have uh, some mixed action for commodities, if you can say that, because crude oil is up ever so slightly, but you can see some of these other major commodities are down. And overall, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is lower, down by about seven-tenths of one percent. Of course, the Bloomberg Dollar Index is higher, pushing commodities uh, lower, sort of a natural uh, headwind. Crude oil trying to hang on to this small gain after declining seven weeks in a row, the longest losing streak since, I believe, November of 2018 as investors remain nonplussed by the OPEC production cuts and uh, lack of knowledge around both uh, demand and supply. Natural gas down another day, down 5.6 percent, down more than 50 percent this year. So the energy complex really struggling. Gold down about nine-tenths of one percent, down for a third day in a row, of course, ahead of the Fed as uh, traders there are rejiggering their bets. And then wheat down 3.6 percent. And some of this, Romy, may have to do with the fact that U.S. exports are, uh, I believe, the most in about a decade, so a lot of supply of wheat. All right. Our thanks there to Abigail. Do a little a nice look at what's going on in the commodity space. And let's stay there, particularly in the energy space, particularly in oil. Occidental Petroleum agreeing to acquire closely held shale driller Crown Rock. It's a cash and stock deal valued at about $10.2 billion. 
adding to the consolidation that we continue to see in the Permian Basin down there in the Texas and Oklahoma regions. Bloomberg's Matthew Monks joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this deal. And, you know, let's just get right to it. This is a big deal. Not, not Occidental is, of course, no stranger to big deals, but $10 billion. It says cash and stock. This is largely going to be financed by debt. Yeah, that's right. They're taking out $9 billion in debt. They're going to issue $2 billion in equity. What's really interesting about this deal is that it's fairly well received today by the street. I think Oxy's shares have been up about 1%. Uh, I think that's really interesting, especially since they're paying a, a rather fair price. I think it works out to about $50,000 per net acre, which is kind of uh, in line with uh, pre-crisis uh, oil and gas lease uh, prices. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that really reflects a couple things. The strategic merits of the deal, it makes sense. The Permian Basin is three parts. You've got the Midland, you've got the Delaware, you've got the Shelf. This really puts Oxy into the Midland in a big way where they weren't at before. So strategically, that makes a lot of sense. And financially, it also makes a lot of sense. They're saying it's going to boost their free cash flow accretion by about a billion dollars in a first year. That's kind of a wonky thing, but investors really, really like it. Mm -hmm. They're going to raise the dividend. Uh, uh, and while they're taking on a lot of debt, they're going to sell, I think, somewhere about four to five billion in assets. So taking the story as a whole, financially it makes sense, strategically it makes sense as well. Strategically, it makes sense as well. Can we zoom out and talk about the sector as a whole right now? Because, uh, of course, this is a big deal in and of itself. But then you think about what's going on with Exxon and Pioneer, what's going on with Chevron and Hess. It feels like this particular sector is so hot right now. What's going on? So the shale boom started with a land grab. Wild catters going out there, finding new land, making bets on it. That part of the, the, the wave is over. Now you're in this phase where you have these large oil and gas companies that might have missed that wave getting out there to try and buy inventory over the next five to ten years at a reasonable price. So they're kind of catching up a little bit late and they're locking it down. And also these companies are disappearing. There aren't that many left. You've still got companies like Diamondback, uh, you've got Endeavor, um, but if you want to seat at the table in the Permian Basin, now's the time to grab a chair. There's been still a lot of concerns about the amount of debt that they're taking on, not only for this deal, but of course they just got done uh, digesting that Anadarko deal yeah, that's from right. a few years ago. And, and it raises the question here too. I mean, I can understand if they do see longer term value there, yeah. but shorter term, investors have put a lot of pressure on this company. Right. There's been a lot yeah. of activists on and off circling this, yes. Carl Icahn, probably the most famous of them. And then we know Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway have built a pretty large stake here. Do they not weigh in on this deal at all? Well, they obviously ran it past Buffett because their plane was going up there uh, multiple times throughout the month. And mm -hmm. Vicky was pretty transparent about that, that mm -hmm. she, you know, she talked it through with, uh, with mm -hmm. Mr. Buffett ahead of doing the deal, which I also think that kind of adds to the credibility that they have here. They didn't just go out there and just kind of strike something wild. They, you know, they talked about it quite extensively mm -hmm. with uh, Warren Buffett, who owns 25 percent of their stock. So I, I think that does add to the credibility of the deal. And also, Anadarko was a $50 billion swing, right? And it didn't go over so well. No. Uh, this is a $10 billion deal, which I know that that is a lot, Yeah. Uh, but it's fairly bite-sized, and they're doing it in a, I would say, and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, pragmatic way. Yeah, All and right. in fairness, too, I mean, in theory, at least, uh, the Crown uh, Rock stuff should actually complement to some degree. Yeah, and this is, and as far as oil and gas stuff goes, yes, yeah. it, so it's right, you know, so it fills them in the Midland. There's some infrastructure that yeah. they can plug into it. And, and with as far as oil and gas stuff yeah. goes, it's great stuff. Gotcha. Yep. All right, Matthew Monks, great stuff as always. And of course, uh, we're talking about M&A on this Monday. We should also talk about Cigna because shares are soaring after it called off its pursuit of Humana. Now, it also announced a $10 billion share buyback, which <laughs> certainly helps. But when it comes to dropping pursuit yeah. of Humana, Man, according to people familiar, it was disagreements over price. Yeah, I think this is funny because this was sort of like the deal that was rumored to have happened, and now we're, it's rumored to have been called off. We, don't, do we ever actually get confirmation from the companies either? But this was a monster deal. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw it. I mean, if, if you just add up their two market caps, you're talking about a hundred billion dollar uh, yeah. market cap on the combined company, which means that's a lot to integrate. It's a lot of synergies you got to find, and more importantly, there's always, of course, the antitrust issues. And then it gets to the point here: Did Humana not think it was worth it based on the price? Price that uh, was allegedly on the table. Yeah, I mean, there's so many uh, interesting little details. I don't think either company actually did confirm it, but obviously those talks falling apart. And uh, you actually saw Jeffrey's upgrade Cigna to buy after we got that news that it had fallen apart, uh, saying that uh, the decision to drop the bid is, quote, doing right by shareholders and clearly shareholders agree on that point. Yeah, and we should point out the executives did say they're still open to acquisitions, but those so-called bolt-on. Bolt so obviously the idea that maybe don't go out and buy, you know, a $60 billion company, maybe try to find something a little smaller that yeah, perhaps. You know, people aren't going to like get, get uh, a little, their knickers in a A twist. little bit bite-sized yeah. there. So Cigna 
uh, soaring. Let's talk about bonds, though, quickly. A quick check on the 10-year yield. Reversing on the day now back to flat. We had been seeing a sell-off. Then we got that 10-year auction at 1 p.m. Interesting. You actually did see it tail slightly, but you can see we had quite the sell-off in anticipation, quite a concession built in, and then maybe the market deciding, hey, demand actually wasn't too bad. 10-year yields currently at 4.23%. Now still ahead on the close, Stiefel is out with its third annual sustainability survey, tracking what brands consumers turn to based on environmental and social issues. More on that next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get right to our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Super Microcomputer, a downgrade to negative from neutral over at Susquehanna, with the analysts saying increased competition and higher storage costs are going to weigh on margins. He also says the company will need to up its game and create more advanced servers that are capable of running some of those AI programs. Those shares, though, down 3% here on the day. Next up, let's take a look at Snap. Wells Fargo, after actually lifting it to equal weight, to over from equal weight to overweight, excuse me, the price target going to $22 from eight bucks a share. The analysts having a pretty big turnaround here, citing the revamped efforts by the company on the advertising front, saying that that can boost both revenue and product growth. Investors seem to think so as well. Those shares higher by 5% on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Nike, getting some love over at City with an upgrade to buy. Described as a one-of-a-kind brand, the analysts saying margin and merchandise recovery, that's on the horizon and saying while the macro challenges will persist, he's still more optimistic about sales growth at the company, leaner inventory at the company, and a new product line for the 2024 Summer Olympics. Shares of Nike up 3% on the day. And those are some of our top calls. Let's stay in the sell side space and let's stick with Nike here. It's one of the top brands that consumers say best handle social sustainability issues. This is according to a new annual survey by Stiefel, which tracks the buying power behind sustainability. Let's get right to it with Jim Duffy. He's a sports and lifestyle brands analyst over at Stiefel to talk a little bit more about this. And uh, let's start off with Nike because I, I thought it was interesting. You, the, basically, this survey it kind of goes through the E, the S, and the G. So we'll stay with the social for right now, the S. Nike ranked number two on the survey. And what I thought was interesting about it was last year when you did the survey, they weren't even in the top 10. What changed? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Nike saw gains from both the Nike brand and the Jordan brand. And I can't say specifically what changed in the perception of consumers, uh, other than I think Nike has had a lot of specific effort to try to uh, increase their relevance with respect to uh, consumers' perception of their sustainability practices, their treatment uh, of labor, treatment of uh, uh, women as athletes, and so forth. So I presume that's, that's had a beneficial impact. Uh, one of the companies that basically makes the top of the list for both environmental sustainability, ethical business practices, and social sustainability is Bombas, which most of us know as a maker of socks. That's right. Bombas, for the third year in a row, ranked at the top of the Stiefel Sustainability Index. Bombas is a, a B Corp, and they're known for their charitable initiatives. For every pair of uh, socks or underwear sold, they give a pair to uh, someone in need. And so that's helped their recognition in the eyes of consumers. And when it comes to layering this on top of the economic environment right now, of course, inflation remains top of mind for consumers, for voters, for companies, for everyone, basically. How do you see consumers or what does the data suggest about how consumers are approaching sustainability desires versus trying to basically uh, manage amid all this inflation? Yeah, very good question, Katie. Um, on a year-to-year -year basis, we saw 62% of consumers were more concerned about the state of the economy this year. 56% are more concerned about their perso personal finances. Sustainability in North America did make modest gains, but the largest gains we saw in our survey were from consumer uh, concern over price and good value. Um, price across uh, each of the five geographies uh, which we sampled, showed the strongest year-to-year -year gains, very statistically significant uh, in European economies. And when it comes to consumers, of course, greenwashing uh, concern in the financial industry, are consumers that discerning? Is there concern that maybe some of these brands aren't as sustainable as they would suggest? 
You know, we're not seeing that in the U.S. data, but there's some interesting findings in the data of uh, uh, consumers in European countries. We actually saw uh, the U.S. narrow the gap to Europe uh, in terms of sustainability importance on a year-to-year -year basis. The U.S., as I mentioned, made modest gains, but we see, saw declines in, in Europe. And we think that may be attributable to greater uh, economic pressures in Europe and perhaps uh, some sustainability fatigue. Uh, there's been a heavier message there of sustainability and perhaps uh, uh, some of that response to greenwashing and so forth has moderated the European consumer's concern. All right, Jim. Uh, great stuff. Uh, Jim Duffy uh, over at Stiefel. A closer look here at their annual survey on uh, sustainability and the companies that consumers prefer in that space. Coming up after the break, we're going to dive into a somewhat tricky issue involving tax law here in the U.S. Natasha Seren is an associate professor at the Yale Law School. She's going to discuss a big case before the Supreme Court that could have a sweeping effect on the U.S. tax code, particularly for investors in foreign companies. That conversation coming up after the break. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Back to the close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment with the host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, who joins us every day around this time. And David, you had a chance to sit down with someone who's been looking into a somewhat complicated issue. It's a tax case before the Supreme Court, but it kind of involves unrealized gains on investments. And I guess it could have broader implications depending on how the court rules. That's exactly right, except I would yeah. say for me, anything having to do with a tax case is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble with all of it. Yeah. But there was a really important case called Moore, Moore against the United States, argued before the Supreme Court last week. So we talked to Natasha Saren, she's associate professor at Yale Law School, also a former deputy assistant secretary of the Treasury, about this case and why it's so important. This is the most important tax case that the Supreme Court has considered in decades. What the particular provision is a pretty obscure provision of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, that levied taxes on American taxpayers with ownership stakes in foreign corporations. The petitioners in this case are a couple. There are a couple named the Moors who are contesting their $15,000 tax bill for a stake that they had in an agriculture company that's headquartered in India called Kissencraft. Uh, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this type of the companies that had foreign profits that were accumulated abroad and U.S. taxpayers that had ownership stakes in those companies, they never faced tax consequences until those profits were repatriated to the U.S. As a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it was a broad-based uh, set of provisions that included very significant tax cuts across the board, for example, for corporations who saw tax rates fall from like 35 percent to 21 percent. And so the drafters of the legislation, they were trying to look for ways to offset some of those revenue losses. And imposing a tax in this case was one of the solutions that they came to. They didn't have in their mind the Moors, whose $15,000 tax bill is kind of small dollars, relative to what was happening by large profitable corporations who were using the fact that they didn't have to pay taxes on these type of stakes to stash uh, profits abroad and avoid, avoid taxation. And so like Apple owed $38 billion from this tax. Google owed $10 billion. Microsoft owed $18 billion. What the Moors are doing in this case is they're challenging the constitutionality of whether or not this tax should have been allowed to be levied at all by claiming that they never realized any income in this case. Of course, obviously they did because they owned a foreign corporation that saw very significant profits. Well, you used a really important word there, realized the income, uh, because as I understand it, uh, the, the foreign corporation did not write a check to the Moors. They didn't actually get money in their bank account. Uh, and you pointed out there's a constitutional issue here. There's a 16th Amendment that was enacted specifically for income tax. Is it income if I don't get the money, if it stays in the corporation? So, David, that is, in fact, at the crux of this case. And you said all of the sort of relevant legal uh, aspects here. The 16th Amendment allows for their constitution places some limits on Congress's ability to levy taxes. One of the limits is that those taxes have to be apportioned proportionally across the states. 
But the income tax, the 16th Amendment, provides an exception to that limit for the purposes of income. And so the question in this case, what the case really turns on, is, is this income? Was this income realized? And the reason why this case is so important is not because of overall the revenue consequences of this case. They're significant. Uh, that's about $340 billion of revenue over the course of a decade, coming again, like nearly all of it, from large profitable corporations, not from individuals like the Moors. The revenue consequences, that's pretty significant money, but it's like small dollars relative to what's at stake in the rest of the code, which operates exactly as this provision does. So when you think, for example, about partnership stakes that are, or S corporations, where taxation is levied not at the entity level, but definitionally we call them pass-throughs, right, because the income is passed through to the individual who has that ownership stake. Or when you think about subpart F of the tax code, which is exactly about ownership stakes, investment income in foreign corporations, which was levied in order to prevent individuals and corporations from being able to have investment income that accumulates abroad just for the purposes of avoiding U.S. taxation. We have designed aspects of the code in exactly the manner that this provision operates. And so the consequences here are the conservative right-leaning tax foundation has estimated that an extreme ruling in this case could cost $6 trillion over the course of a decade because it would throw the entire tax code into an, a shroud of uncertainty. And that's why Speaker Paul Ryan, who actually sort of drafted the legislation and is intimately familiar with this particular case, that's why he's heavily focused on the fact that this case is a misfire from a constitutional perspective because there's no real question here. In this case, income was very clearly realized. And here we have a case just like subpart F, just like pass-throughs, where taxation is levied at individuals for their ownership stakes. Uh, so, Professor, uh, you mentioned partnerships and subchapter S, pass-through corporations. Talk about a regular corporation. I own stock in GM, let's say, and they have retained earnings that they do not distribute to me as a dividend. They don't buy back the stock. Theoretically, could Congress tax that income to me that GM is not distributing? So an important, and you're kind of raising the, you're kind of raising what ends up being a pretty important set of issues for this case, even though I want to be clear that they're distinct. The groups that are behind the Moors, that are the conservative advocacy groups that are pushing this case, what they are really after is not Section 965 of Subpart F, this particular provision of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. What they are focused on is trying to have the Supreme Court preemptively weigh in on taxation, like on other means of taxation of unrealized capital gains. For example, through schemes like wealth taxation or through a direct mark to market tax of unrealized capital gains. Think if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you have your stake in Meta that's appreciated very significantly. Uh, over the course of your lifetime, that's like your wealth. And so can we get at, can we tax that wealth uh, in this manner? That was Natasha Saron of the Yale Law School. And Roman, as I said, I find taxes complicated no yeah. matter what. Yeah. But to have the two extreme positions, on the one hand, people are saying, if you don't allow them to tax this stuff, then in fact, people can keep all their income offshore, they can keep it in capital yeah. gains. The other side is they're saying, wait a second, what you're trying to do is actually a wealth tax yes. and tax capital gains. So there are two extremes. The court, by the way, can decide it more narrowly. Yeah, I mean, just from my own layman's perspective, when I first read about the story, that was the first thing. that I was like, oh, this is basically a wealth tax. But then I guess the government's saying, no, no, it's an income tax. You just haven't necessarily realized that income into your pockets, but it's been realized somewhere else. I don't quite understand why they have the government has a leg to stand on, but, uh, you know, I guess maybe it'll be sorted out. The one thing we know is they yeah. need the money. The government. <laughs> they need to yeah, yeah. That's the way they paid for those yeah. Trump tax cuts, yeah. right? That's a practical one. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, interesting <laughs> case. Okay, tomorrow we're going to move from taxes over to green energy. Michael Polsko will be here. He's Invenergy CEO. He deals with the grid. He says the biggest problem we have is not those solar panels. It's actually the grid to support it all. And then on Friday on Wall Street Week, we're going to be joined by Glenn August, Oak Hill Advisors founder and CEO. We'll be talking about distressed investing. That's coming up on Friday at 6 p.m. New York time, Romain. All right, another great uh, lineup. 
uh, for uh, Wall Street Week. And you can catch David Weston every day around this time for our Wall Street Week daily segment right here on the close. As we round out into the final hour of the trading, you take a look at the markets, a bit of a holding pattern as we await what is going to be a big week. Uh, consequential economic data tomorrow here in the U.S. on the inflation front and that two-day Fed meeting, a big decision, and more importantly, big communication on Wednesday. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And Katie, you came back here to a market that I guess is kind of in a bit of a holding pattern. This is going to be a big week. Got a big economic data and, of course, the big Fed meeting here. And a lot of people think this could be it for the year, that if you're looking for a liquid market, this is about as liquid as it's going to get for the next uh, three or four weeks until yeah. we get into the top of the year here. You take a look at the price action, though, on the day, and it is to the upside. Uh, market's trying to extend what is now basically a six-week rally, mm -hmm. at least for the S&P 500, a modest rally, but I think some folks will take it. Modest, but you take a look at, like you mentioned, the streak there, and it is meaningful. The S&P 500 only up about three-tenths of a percent right now. You look for pockets of outperformance, you absolutely see that in the chips right now, not so much in crypto. Uh, we're yeah. back to 40,000. I'm curious, though, about if you flip up the board here, 46.17 on the S&P 500, and this has really been the bugaboo, right, that 4,600 line, the retest of that, the potential uh, breakthrough of that, and we just have not really broke th broken through it meaningfully. Even at a close of 46.17, I'm not sure that's going to give a lot of people confidence that the trend line is still up. Well, you think about some of the resistance we're hitting and the momentum that we've seen thus far. Maybe we just need a catalyst. Maybe we'll get that this week. But let's talk about some of the individual big movers today because there's quite a lot of them. We have to start with Macy's. This is M&A Monday. Apparently, of course, the big story there, Macy's receiving a $5.8 billion buyout offer from a group that includes Arc House Management and Brigade Capital Management. Uh, that would be for $21 a share. Macy's shares up 20%. What I do think of this interesting about it when you really look under the hood here this does seem to be a lot more about the real estate assets that Macy's has, which we know are very valuable, and some people would even argue some of those assets might be more valuable than the actual business of reselling clothes. So it'll be interesting to see uh, whether they, this actually does, does turn into a deal to take private. Yeah, time will tell, but clearly uh, traders cheering on that news right now. Let's also talk about Cigna. Uh, this is a very interesting story. We've talked about it a little bit today, but Cigna, uh, it's walking away from its pursuit of Humana. It's also planning a significant increase to its stock buyback plan, adding about $10 billion dollars there. Uh, it's interesting. You think about Cigna Humana, that enormous combination that that would create. But of course, the two sides, according to people familiar with the matter, they couldn't agree on price, even though strategically, yeah. maybe this made sense. Well, if you ever want to know what investors really think about some of these deals, the fact the shares are up 17 percent, I think tells you all you need to know. The market is yeah. always right. Let's talk a little bit about <laughs> Eli Lilly here. Uh, we also talked about this. That's, a little, that, bit that's a little bit of an overstatement. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Eli Lilly shares down about two and a half percent right now. That's after a study came out and said that after you stop taking ZepBound, of course, their weight loss drug, uh, after eight months, participants in this study regained half the weight that they lost a year earlier. But what we've been talking about, of course, you lose half the weight or you gain back half the weight. You've still lost half the weight. So it seems like a silver lining. I, l I love it that you, you now you're doing math. Because, <laughs> trying. Uh, but, well, it is fine. I mean, look, if you lose 40 pounds and you gain back 20 of it, I mean, you're still down 20 pounds. Which, That's not too bad. Uh, I mean, you know. <laughs> anyway, solid. we're less than one hour away from the closing bells. Cross that platform coverage of today's top stories. It starts right now. Down to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're joined right now by our colleagues Molly Smith and John Tucker in today for Carol Masser and Tim Stenevich. A hearty Monday welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership here on YouTube. Uh, a mixed day here uh, in the markets here. Green across the screen here, but a bit of a holding pattern, Molly, ahead of what's going to be a busy week for the macro. Yeah, that's right. We were just talking about it here on our side. Uh, I mean, really, there's, gosh, so much to start with. But CPI, the big inflation report being the first uh, big market driver of the week, that's coming out tomorrow. So we'll see what that inflation report has to say. Probably is not going to 
be that consequential for the Fed meeting, which then wraps up on Wednesday, pretty much already set in that we're going to see an interest rate hold then. But as we were just saying, look out for what the summary of economic projections and the dot plot have to say. A couple more economic reports mixed in toward the end of the week, but those are really the two big events between now and Friday. Yeah, Fed, what Fed? 4796. <laughs> That's the number I'm focused on. That's the record that was set in January of 2022 for the S&P 500, and we're what? three, four percent away at this point. And more strategists see a march higher as well. We heard from John Stolfis looking at uh, 5,200 uh, next year. About a quarter of respondents in the latest Bloomberg survey also say they plan to increase their stock exposure mm -hmm. over the next month. Strap in. And maybe if they do, we'd finally see some money come out of those money market funds. That has just been a continued climb higher. But uh, you think about some of the catalysts here. What could be a catalyst? Maybe we'll hear about rate cut plans yeah. on Wednesday, but maybe not. Okay, you guys are boring me with all this macro <laughs> talk here. I, I mean, look, I was looking. There's some big stories crossing the wire uh, today here. A lot of individual stories here, uh, Molly, including in the streaming space. I was just taking a look at Paramount. Those shares are lower here on the day. They're rebranding. Yeah, Paramount Showtime. was one. You know, I was really looking yeah. more at Netflix today, actually, in yeah. the streaming space, because they are going to put on a live tennis event in March. So you know where I will be on March 3rd? It will be an exhibition match between uh, Rafa Nadal and Carlos Alcaraz. And, you know, these streaming guys, they've been trying to figure out what are we going to do with live sports. Oh, wait, it's so this isn't like... You, they're actually putting on their own match. They are, yeah. So this it's called the this Netflix like Slam by the, by the An tour. exhibition. The Netflix Slam. Okay, that's good. Are they yeah. are they actually going to go all out, or is this going to be like one of those friendlies where they just throwing lobs <laughs> at each other? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Who yeah. knows? They could be mic'd up and like you know having some crowd work in between. It's not going to be mm. for any ranking points. This is just for fun, more in that sense. But yeah. it, I mean, who knows? I remember you know, when I was a little kid, I actually got to yeah. play against John McEnroe. Did you? And let me tell you, what? he he. he he, he showed no mercy for us kids. <laughs> I, I was like, what, what? I mean, at the time, I didn't realize it, but as an adult, I'm like, you know, dude, come on, chill. I got to say, I really yeah. love that energy. No yeah. mercy, just all out. Uh, let's also talk about movies, though, because uh, it's Golden Globe nomination season. Uh, it feels like all summer, all we were talking about was Barbie and Oppenheimer. And apparently, uh, that's going to be the same conversation at the Golden Globes. You take a look at Barbie earning nine nominations. That's the most this year. That ties it for the second most nominated film of all time. Then you have Oppenheimer bringing in eight nominations. So uh, probably no surprise when you think about how much of the conversation, the national conversation, these two films were. Uh, I'm confused. Were these the two best movies of the year? Oh, I would love to hear your opinion. Uh, well, I've only seen one of them. I didn't see Barbie. I did see Oppenheimer. That's so interesting because Which, I only saw Barbie. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Pretty sure well, John know. and I saw Let's neither, see. so you did guys John, have did to fill it Did you and John go us. together to go see Barbie and Oppenheimer on the same day? I read the book. Does that count? The Barbie book? No. No, 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 one, re no one reads anymore, John. Oh, by what the way, you know... Uh, yeah. Celebrity Lodestone. There's no host yet for the Golden Globes. Oh, my God. We just glossed Maybe right over that one. the host is among us. Just kidding. Mm, could All be. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that does it for now. We'll be back together again live on television and radio, as well as YouTube at 4 p.m. for our Beyond the Bell coverage, where we take you through today's market close. And a reminder that Bloomberg Business Week is now on Bloomberg Originals. And we continue our markets coverage right here on Bloomberg Television, counting you down to the close on this Monday afternoon. A little more than 50 minutes until we get there. And a lot of questions right now about whether a record high is in the cards for U.S. stocks next year. Respondents to the latest Bloomberg M Live poll survey say yes. Investors expect the U.S. to avoid a recession, but they view weaker consumers as the biggest threat to that rally. Diane Jaffe joining us right now, senior portfolio manager over at TCW, joining us today here in New York in our Bloomberg studios. Great to see you. Nice to see you too, Roman and Katie. All right, let's get straight to the outlook here. It seems like everybody's pretty bullish on 2024, are you? Um, I'm cautiously optimistic, I would mm -hmm. say. Earnings are important, valuation is important, and we think that there are spots in the market that an active manager can really uh, do a good job for their clients with. Do you think 2024, the discussion here on, on Bloomberg Television amongst investors is going to be more about the macro and the Fed and interest rates or more about, I guess, the idiosyncratic stories of individual stocks and sectors? I'd like to say it's idiosyncratic mm. stories, but the macro always has to come in. Mm. And there, there, there's enough upheaval in the world to make your jobs pretty difficult, I think, all year long. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about the macro here because this is a heavy macro week. Uh, of course, we have the Fed on Wednesday, expected to be a third consecutive hold from then. But think about the outlook next year and how many rate cuts are being priced in. Is this just another form of fighting the Fed? Is that what we're witnessing when it comes to what's being priced in and what the Fed is saying? Yes, I would pay attention really, Katie, to what the Fed is saying. They want to be higher for longer. And as long as the economy holds up, jobs hold up, they can keep them the rates pretty high. I don't think that any Fed member wants to see zero bound again. Mm. And when you're thinking about your base case, is that your base case higher for longer? And how do you position a portfolio around it? One of the things that we do for our clients is we're always diversified across all major 11 sectors. I think that really helps people when all of a sudden energy shoots up in the middle of the year like it did, or when you want to have some defensive posturing in your portfolio. So we always have representation. But frankly, we tend to be overweight the inexpensive sectors and underweight the expensive sectors. And I think that value orientation with earnings poised for growth is going to help our clients in the long run. There's been a lot of talk about value and sort of what constitutes value. Some people would argue that you can find value in some of those, what looks to be expensive, some of those big cap names, because maybe we're not measuring it right. I've never quite understood that argument, but when you look at the investor trends, there does seem to be this sense here that what we traditionally think of value maybe just isn't in the realm of, of thought amongst a lot of investors. So that drift, yeah. what constitutes value, I think is a very important moment uh -huh. because I agree with you, Romaine, that you want to have some basis in fact, mm -hmm. earnings or book value or sales. Um, those are the things we like to tether the portfolio valuations to. When, when all of a sudden you say, okay, Google, which is true, has an irreplaceable search engine, at least for now, right now there's a lot more competition and therefore it constitutes value makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of trespassing between the value and growth space. And mm -hmm. I think that Bodes for difficult times ahead. Yeah, and it's interesting too because when we talk about value, we know there's a lot of individual stories when it comes to value, but that's also tied directly to the macro conditions. And I think that scared a lot of people away because no one really seems to know where the economy is going to go. Some predictions say we're going to continue coasting at maybe three, four percent GDP growth rate, and other people see a recession. So we would strike a little bit more of a balance mm -hmm. for that. We always recession test all of the names in our portfolio over the next one to two years, right? That's what you want an active management uh, team to do. And our analysts are great across the board. So uh, for us, we're saying, okay, slower growth. Already the Atlanta Fed is saying 1% to 2% for the fourth quarter. That seems about right to us. Mm -hmm. And um, But, you know, we want to make sure that we're protecting our clients in case it gets worse than that down the road. Can we talk about banks a little bit? Because I'm going through your notes and you point out that financials should be doing better. And I've been scratching my head for a few years now trying to figure out what financials actually trade off of. Uh, what, make some sense of financials for me. Okay, that's a great question, Katie. So we do a lot of statistical analysis going back, you know, 5, 10, 25 years to determine which of the valuation factors are most um, correlated with that company's stock price over time. So most banks, for example, are best measured by price to book, but you get asset light uh, financials and they're best measured on price to earnings ratio or price to cash flow. So you have to be a little sensitive to that. But generally speaking, price to book is where it's at. Um, and banks, if you look at the uh, KBW index, they're trading at Mm, 1.1 times price to book. It's very inexpensive. Even on a PE, it's less than 10 times. And of course, you mentioned that when it comes to being well diversified, you like to be across all the sectors. But when you think about the leaders this year, do you think that necessarily they're going to be the leaders next year? Or are we going to start actually seeing some of those inexpensive sectors take their place? Whenever you have huge profit margins like you do at NVIDIA or any of these big leaders, of course, there's a whole bunch of competition coming in. We saw that with AMD, maybe not going to be within striking distance of NVIDIA anytime soon. But come on, these companies are filled with people like you and me. They want to get some of that profit share. So of course there's going to be competition and therefore we think, you know, some of those big leaders, you know, they're still leaders for a good reason, but they're going to be lots of more opportunities for your clients and viewers. All right, Diane, it's always great to speak with you. Great to see you on set. That is Diane Jaffe. She is senior portfolio manager over at TCW. Now coming up, we'll speak with Ellen Zentner. She is the chief U.S. economist over at Morgan Stanley for her insight on this week's Fed decision. And we're going to take a look at why billionaire Steve Cohen is pushing 0.72 deeper into macro trading. More than 50 teams right now under that umbrella. And 
we'll discuss the economics of baseball as Shohei Otani signs a record-breaking $700 million deal with the Dodgers. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Wednesday, the Fed decides. We're talking rates. We're talking inflation. Without a recession, that's the good stuff. Will officials pause as expected? We're heading into the end of the year. We're in a soft landing right now. Will they put rate cuts on the table for 2024? It remains to be seen. The data will dictate that. Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. Everything was hedged. They're going to have to have a good reason to do whatever. Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. With about 43 minutes until we get to the closing bells here in New York, if you like uh, uh, semiconductor stocks and if you like healthcare stocks, this is your day. Cigna, one of the biggest uh, gainers here in the market across the board. Also, uh, uh, you look taking a look at Broadcom, also moving higher here on the day. In fact, most of the chip stocks moving higher with maybe the exception of NVIDIA, which is taking a little bit of a breather, maybe some profit taking. Nevertheless, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index posting up one of its strongest days that it's had in a while, up about 4%. Meanwhile, the rest of the broader market, I guess in a bit of a holding pattern, waiting on some of the economic data and the big Fed meeting. The S&P 500 only up about three-tenths of a percent here on the day. And you can see some of the other major indices also just holding on to fractional gains. I do want to highlight a couple of idiosyncratic stories, and this largely surrounds changes that, uh, changes in the executive leadership here. Ring Central losing its new CEO, Tarek Robiati, who's only been there three months. They did not say why he's leaving, but he's out. Shake Shack CEO plans to retire at the beginning of 2024. They're going to look for a permanent replacement for him. Boeing elevated Stephanie Pope, who was leading that services division, to COO. And now a lot of speculation because the current CEO is near retirement age and a lot of speculation about whether Pope might actually succeed to the CEO position. And BlackBerry uh, also looking at a change in leadership and a retention of one of the key units that it had, that Internet of Things unit that it had planned to spin off, now saying that it plans to retain that unit and keep it alongside its cybersecurity vision. But of course, this is going to be a big week for the macro. So let's get to Abigail Doolittle, who's standing by with our Options Insight segment. And you're taking a look, Abigail, at what has got to be, I guess, the biggest event of the week, and that's the Fed meeting. It's hard not to look at the Fed this week. Everybody's been thinking about it for many weeks now, and some traders remain. In fact, I would say many traders are thinking that the Fed has already signaled some kind of pivot, that they are done with their hiking cycle, and they're going to be moving quickly into cutting. The Fed, though, has not said that. So what will they be saying on Wednesday? I'm very pleased to say joining me today is the retired editor and publisher of the Gartman Letter, Dennis Gartman, who is now presently the chairman of University of Akron's uh, Endowment and Investment Committee. Terrific to have you with us, Dennis. I can't think of a better person to speak to this week. So what do you think the Fed's going to be talking about on Wednesday? Or specifically, I think the Fed's going to be talking about the fact that they intend to keep rates high for longer, not higher for longer. They're going to keep rates uh, steady through the course of the next year. I, as far as I'm concerned, I continue to believe that uh, Mr. Powell means it when he says he's going to fight to get inflation back to 2%. And they won't raise rates much more if they raise them at all. So I, rather than saying higher for longer, I've said high for longer. I was uh, early on, almost 19 months ago, saying that they, they would be happy to get the Fed funds rate above 4%, maybe even to 5 We're there. They're probably done. Maybe at most one more cut, one more increase, but it's going to be quite some period of time before the Fed moves to ease monetary policy, at least late into 20, 20, 2024 maybe early into 2025 before we see a, a, a cut in the overnight Fed funds rate. It's hard to disagree with you, Dennis, given the fact that this Fed has been unbelievably transparent in terms of what they say that they're going to do, and they do exactly that, and they have indicated yes. uh, high for longer, higher for longer, whatever you want to call it. What sort of volatility will this bring for commodities and other asset classes? Uh, high rates tend to deaden commodity prices more often than not. I think we're going to see some changes coming up. We've seen some enormous volatility, however, in the gold market over the course of the past month, actually over the course of the past week, uh, you had gold up almost $150 an ounce last Monday, and now we're down almost $200 from its high. Rather extraordinary movements in, in the gold market. Gold is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, gold is the old people's gold market, and Bitcoin is the young people's gold market. 
and you see money coming out of out of uh, gold and going into Bitcoin at, at the margin, and I think that's likely to continue. I've been bullish on gold for a while, but clearly the past week has been uh, deleterious to my uh, bullish outlook on the gold market. No question about that. Yeah, it does seem to be dropping back down into a range, and it's interesting that Bitcoin, uh, I guess digital gold, uh, over the last day or two has been under pressure too. Perhaps as yes. traders really are rejiggering some of these Fed bets. And I know that you think that term structure structure is so important when we take a look at commodities or, you know, here on the Options Insight, we are frequently taking a look at the, the VIX curve, which right now is uh, steeply in contango. Uh, why is this so important? The, I've always said that the term structure is where informed, sophisticated money leaves its footprints. And it's especially true in the crude oil market. You, you move from a massive backwardation uh, several weeks, uh, several months ago, actually, to a, a modest and, and increasing contango. Contangos are bearish for commodity prices on balance. Backwardations are bullish on, on commodity prices on balance. And you have to watch the, sh the changing shape of the, of the term structure itself. As we were going higher a month and a half ago in crude oil, for several days on end, you had the front month actually beginning to lose relative to the second, third, and fourth contract back. And that was an indication to me that the backwardation was beginning to narrow and the market was likely to come under pressure. As long as we continue to see on the front month the losing relative to the back months on up days and down days, you have to continue to re remain bearish of crude oil. So I think crude wants to go still lower. It's, it's fallen rather precipitously in the course of the past two and a half, three weeks or, or a month or so, but I think it wants to go lower. So pay attention to the, to the term structure. It is very important in storable commodities, whether it's crude oil, cotton, soybeans, bean meal. The term structure is where sophisticated money leaves its footprints and you pay attention to the term structure shifts and over time. And it sounds like more volatility is ahead. Dennis Gartman, retired editor and publisher of the Gartman Letter and presently chairman of the University of Akron's Endowment Investment Committee. Thank you so much for joining us for Options Insight today. Great perspective. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Apple plans to offer new incentives to artists and record labels that produce music using Dolby Atmos. That is a spatial audio technology that surrounds its listeners in sound. This is according to sources. Now, that could mean higher royalty payments from at Apple. So they're really trying to entice musicians yeah. onto their platform, of course, trying to compete so, with the likes of Spotify. I, I'm really into this. I mean, because this is basically just kind of the next iteration of surround sound that some of us who are old enough to remember, you would set up your, your house with all these speakers and all these different locations, and it would give you kind of this uh, spatial performance. And nothing has really been able to replicate that in the uh, sort of the, in the digital space, not just streaming, but even if when you buy an MP3 or something like that, you don't get it. But I should point out, there are companies that have been doing this a lot better than Apple. I mean, and, and when Apple finally announced the Atmos on for Apple Music, I tried it out. Yeah. And it was... Uh, not, it was buggy. <laughs> Let's just say that. And uh, I don't want to get myself in trouble. Yeah. But I have heard it in other places. I mean, it was a great uh, remix, or not remix, a remastering they did a, a, of an old Supremes album. Uh -huh. And they did one on the Pogues as well. And it was fantastic. Yeah. But, the problem is you need the right player to listen to it. And unfortunately, the iPhone was not it. So the takeaway from this conversation is that you use Apple Music. No, the takeaway is I don't use Apple Music You don't? Anymore. Do you use Spotify? No. Okay. Well, this is the close on Bloomberg. Sorry. <laughs> you seem so disappointed at me. <laughs> This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes until we get to the end of the trading day, Katie. And so far on this Monday, we are looking at gains at the index level. Gains, too, when you take a look at the sector level, 10 of 11 or, you know, 9 of 11. Well, we'll give consumer discretionary a few minutes here. Anyway, the takeaway is that there are a lot of green bars on this screen behind me. Up at the top, you have consumer staples up about 9 tenths of a percent. Industrials, too, having a pretty good day. You go down the list, consumer discretionary, we'll call that unchanged. Having a bad day, I think it's fair to say, is communication services off by about 1.2 percent. Remain a lot of that coming from Paramount. Now 10 of 11, <laughs> Katie Dreyfeld. you got to keep your eye on the ball there. It moves pretty fast here, and you take a look at some of the individual movers. 
Alphabet shares down for a second straight day. In fact, all of the Magnificent Seven in the red here on the day. And an interesting story on Endeavor. Shares down 7%. Remember, it had that rally of about 40% over the course of a couple of weeks in late October, early November on the back of that report that Silver Lake was actually looking to take that company private again here. And now David Faber over at CNBC throwing cold water on that, saying that apparently that deal is still a long way away from getting done and may not get done at all. And then two interesting stories after the bell tonight. We are getting some earnings out of Casey's General Store, which is having a relatively good year. And Oracle also set to report after the bell tonight, Katie. Those shares, both shares up about a percent here on the day. Well, let's focus back in on the macro and on the Federal Reserve, of course, as the central bank prepares for its policy announcement on Wednesday. Joining us now for her take on what to keep an eye on, we have Ellen Zentner. She is chief U.S. economist over at Morgan Stanley. Delighted to say she joins us now. And Ellen, of course, we get the decision at 2 p.m. And then we get Jerome Powell 30 minutes later. What is going to be the communication coming from Jerome Powell? What line is he trying to tow here? Well, I think he's set up much better going into this meeting than he was just, say, one week ago when the market was putting a 60 percent probability that rate cuts would start in March next year. Now that down to 40 percent after the unemployment rate fell on Friday. And so what does that mean for Chair Powell and the Fed on Wednesday? It means they have full flexibility around when they actually start cutting rates next year. And so his message can stay pretty balanced. We don't want to declare victory on inflation, even though inflation has come down so much that they're going to revise their forecasts lower for next year. Um, but hey, we don't know yet whether a hike or a cut is the next move. We're just on hold here. Stay with us for a time and we'll let you know when we're ready to make the next move. So the hope is it's a pretty easy ride for him going into the end of the year. And that's his last time that he's going to take a bite out of the apple uh, before next year. So who knows if it's going to be a hike or a cut, but you take a look at markets and it seems like everyone is expecting that a cut will be their next move. But Ellen, I think that the most important question here is why? Why would they start cutting? And you think about your own projections over at Morgan Stanley. Would they start cutting because they're just normalizing, they're getting out of restrictive, or are they cutting because potentially we're heading into some sort of downturn? Yeah, Katie, so that's a narrative that they are going to have to be crystal clear on and own because that is a very different approach to cutting than in prior cutting episodes when we are faced with end of cycle downturn like uh, uh, dynamics in the economy. So this is something that Governor Waller alluded to in his comments before the blackout in sort of that kind of Taylor rule setting where when inflation is coming down, you're, you should be cutting rates in line with falling inflation. And that means you're not easing policy. You're just maintaining the same level of restrictiveness, as you put it, normalizing. That is something that the Fed is going to grab onto that Chair Powell has mentioned in the past, but he's not really given it sort of full-throated view uh, out there. And so I think that he's going to be really setting that up at this meeting, that this is the environment we're in now. We're in a pretty good place where we can be patient. And when we do start to adjust policy, it will really be normalizing rates. And that means slow and steady. So again, it's just about when do they start that slow and steady process next year. Because this also gets to the idea, Ellen, about the financial market conditions and how the market is going to respond to any communication about the end of rate tightening and the potential for rate cuts here. Uh, they, it's very clear that they're very in tune to financial market conditions, the tightening and easing of those. And they do see, seem to see that as being complementary, uh, at least they want it to be complementary, I should say, to whichever direction they're going. Yeah. So financial conditions do matter right now. Obviously, they've eased a good deal uh, since the November meeting. Um, but it's really about in line with where the Fed would think financial conditions should be. Now, that's uh, that's reflexivity between the uh, the financial markets and the Fed. The Fed uh, has shown in its dot plot that it is likely to deliver a couple of cuts next year. We think when we get those updated projections, it will show three cuts next year. And the market has already been priced in that expectation. So financial conditions today really reflect what the Fed is likely going to deliver. So there's really nothing for the Fed to push back here uh, on in terms of market expectations. So it's really just 
towing the line, moving into the new year with the markets already set about where the Fed would like them to be, and the market pricing 40 percent chance of a cut in March is not really outside of the realm of possibility yeah, in the Fed's view. And it's interesting to see uh, the price action. I mean, even you take yields on, on the shorter end, the two-year, we've gone from well above 5 percent or just, uh, I think, what was in late uh, September and now around 4.7 today. And it raises the question as to whether people are actually getting more comfortable extending duration and buying on the longer end of the curve rather than just trying to sort of, I guess, pan it all out around the shorter end of the curve, which is much more directly tied to the Fed. Yeah, well, I also think that uh, you know, as much as we seem to be very focused on what is the Fed going to do in the immediate term, I think where there should be more focus is in our view of what is inflation doing as we get further into this process? I don't think that anything has changed cyclically in the way inflation develops over the business cycle. And that means that inflation is probably going to continue to come down more quickly than the Fed thinks. And so we have them actually starting off cutting slowly. But by the fourth quarter of the year, they're speeding up to every single meeting and delivering another 200 basis points and cuts in 25. And I'm not talking about recession. I'm just talking about the pace that they'll be having to normalize and then ultimately ease policy in 2025 in order to maintain that soft landing. Uh, and so that's just inflation's going to come down faster than they think. And I think that's really where I see the markets off sides in terms of where I think they should be priced is for that faster pace of policy uh, declines as we move into the second half of 24 and into 25. Well, Ellen, let's talk about the opposite scenario there. Obviously, your expectation that inflation is going to fall more quickly than the Fed expects. But how big of a risk is that actually we see a pickup in inflation, a reacceleration of inflation? When you take a look at the d dynamics of this economy, is that a possibility? It, it's absolutely a possibility. And that's why the uncertainty bands have to be so wide uh, for the Fed or any forecaster. So why did we revise upward uh, consumer spending this year? It was really because the wealthy that do the bulk of spending in the U.S. more aggressively drew down their savings than we had expected. And we think that's pretty much played out. We think a lot of pent-up demand has been met. We're seeing some slowing in spending there. But what if there's just no slowdown? And the wealthy just keep spending with wild abandon and keep drawing down that savings rate. And we roll right into next year with price tolerance levels just as high, prices just as high, the ability to press on price increases just as high for companies. Then we're going to be wrong on consumer spending and inflation is also going to be higher. And that is also a risk to the outlook. I'm curious about the, the other pillar of this, a much smaller pillar of the economy, but still important, and that's business spending. We've seen a lot of companies uh, tighten their belts a little bit when it comes to certain uh, capex and research and development spending. Does that become a concern at all? Yeah, so we're seeing that, uh, especially in terms of equipment investment, it has uh, it's still falling prey to higher uh, interest rates. It has taken some time for that to flow through, but we think there's still some time yet before uh, biz parts of business investment finally turn positive. So we're still going through a contraction there. And I think what is interesting about the research we've done is that monetary policy drag. Was there just no drag? Was there, does there need to be more drag? Is it a lagged drag? And really, it's this quarter where that fiscal impulse is finally overcome by the monetary policy drag, and that starts to grow through 2024. And so that monetary policy drag is certainly showing up more in the credit markets, in business investment, business spending. And that's why we're very confident that we will get the kind of slowing in the economy that we think is needed for the Fed to start cutting rates. All right, Ellen, got to leave it there. Always great to speak with you. Appreciate the time. That is Ellen Zentner of Morgan Stanley. Now coming up, the top three. It's our new segment where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
right, time now for the top three every day at this time. We do a deep dive into the people at the center of today's top stories. Joining us now is Scarlett Fu. Scarlett, who are you keeping an eye on? I am watching the embattled Harvard president, Claudine Gay. Her job is increasingly in jeopardy after UPenn president Liz McGill resigned on Saturday, and that follows their testimony uh, to Congress last week that went less than well. Uh, they gave heavily lawyered answers when asked if they called, if calling for the genocide of Jews violates school policy, their answer was essentially, it depends on context. And of course, that led to a huge uproar. And uh, the latest is more than 700 faculty members have signed a petition urging Harvard leadership to resist political pressures. But of course, alumni and donors are pushing for otherwise. Interesting. Uh, you know, keep an eye on that. I'm actually keeping an eye on uh, Steve Cohen uh, over at uh, Point72. And an interesting sort of move into broader move, I should say, into macro trading here, uh, adding additional uh, fund managers uh, in the macro space. They're now going to have 51 macro trading teams uh, based on the hires, I guess, that we've been tracking here. And it raises a lot of questions as to exactly whether these teams are going to end up working against each other or with each other. <laughs> 51 seems like a lot, but, you know. Yeah, I was thinking, are there even that many asset classes? I know there's that many uh, yeah, cryptocurrencies. I was thinking the same Louise. thing. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see. So you introduced him as the point seventy two guy. Yeah, I heard he has a side gig. He's also yeah. the, the New York Mets yeah. owner, uh, which leads nicely into what I want to talk about, and I know that Scarlett wants to talk about as well. We're talking about Major League Baseball superstar Shohei Otani. He announced a contract with the Los Angeles Do Dodgers for a record-breaking $700 million over 10 years. And Scarlett, I was off last week, uh, but this news did reach me. This news did reach you. Yeah, it's the largest contract in any U.S. professional sport. It surpasses what Aaron Judge got paid, what Mike Trout's getting paid, uh, what Patrick Mahomes got signed for. So it's pretty incredible. The, the, the big thing about this is that he's going to take a lot of this in deferred salary. So uh, it doesn't work out to $70 million a year. It'll be initially something in the neighborhood of $50 million, and then later on he'll get paid more after the contract. How good is this guy? Like, what, what is seven hundred? He's a double million? threat. He's a double threat. He's a pitcher. He's a hitter. He's everything. Okay. All right. So there you go, Romain. Yeah. I mean, look. I I, mean, I hope this works out for the Angels because that's a huge commitment that you're making to somebody who Dodgers, last time Dodgers. I checked um, actually can't pitch today. Yeah, he got a Tommy John surgery, as I understand. Well, it's worked out for the Angels because well, they he, get rid of him. But he got the whole the thing, Dodgers. or just the Tommy or the John? I don't no. All right, we're counting you down to the closing bell. Stick with us. Mira Panda, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist, going to be joining us in just a second with 14 minutes until the close. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bells with just about 10 minutes to go. Sox holding on to some fractional gains on the day, but I don't think they're getting any help out of the Magnificent Seven today. No, absolutely not. Magnificent Seven is seeing all seven members down, and you mentioned fractional gains. The moves have been fractional over the last, what, two weeks. It's been almost one month since the S&P 500 has closed with a move of 1% or more, uh, November 14th. So we're keeping a close eye on what the next catalyst could be, and it may very well be that inflation report on Tuesday. Absolutely. Uh, the S&P right now testing that 4,600 level. And when you push ahead to some of the estimates for 2024, the average is just around that 47, 4,800 mark, though some folks think we could go closer to 5,000 and beyond. It'd be interesting to see sort of what drives that, if anything at all. Let's get some insights out of Mira Pandit, J.P. Morgan Asset Management Global Market Strategist, joining us here on set to help count down to those closing bells. And uh, Mira, I do want to start off with the outlook for 2024, which you and your team are calling, if I get this right, the 2024 economy. Explain that to me. That's right. 2024 should mm -hmm. be a 2024 economy, so 2% growth, zero recessions, 2% inflation, 4% unemployment. Really getting back to trend after mm -hmm. seeing an unusual reacceleration in the economy mm -hmm. this year. I think where we're headed is normalization first. Perhaps we could see a little bit of slowing from then. Mm -hmm. But if we think about growth, five consecutive quarters of above trend growth, very strong labor markets. We probably see a bit of more normalization from here. But I think that's where we're heading to somewhat of a Goldilocks scenario in mm -hmm. 2024. It does seem like a Goldilocks scenario, at least a softish landing scenario. Is that going to be enough for investors, particularly when I look at the 2 percent growth? Yes, we avoid recession. But this is a market that appears to be pricing in much more than avoiding recession. They appear to be pricing in a much stronger economy. 
there is a dichotomy yeah. here between our economic outlook, expecting some pretty benign macro backdrop overall, mm. versus what we think we actually get out of the markets, given that it feels like we're operating a bit on borrowed returns here, given the 20 plus percent rally in the equity market and expectations for earnings to exceed, you know, to, to go into double digits next year, 11 percent or so. We think we can get about half of that because ultimately, even though we had a very strong economy this year, uh, that's old news. Where we're headed towards is something a little bit slower, particularly when we think about the commentary we heard in the third quarter from CEOs expecting a, a bit of a gloomier outlook. We look at the Atlanta Fed GDP track at about 1.2% mm -hmm. for this, this current quarter. Um, and I think if you put all that together, that's going to put some pressure on revenues. So those profit expectations feel very lofty. Even if margins say somewhat stable, look, disinflation, helpful for markets, helpful for margins, not so much on the revenue side. So I think there'll be a bit of a tug of war there that's going to result in reasonable profit growth. Mm. But the multiple expansion we've seen just in the last couple yeah. of weeks, the sentiment rally yeah. uh, might take away from that a little bit next year. Yeah. Is that something that investors have fully discounted, this idea that revenue growth will be under pressure even as margins um, continue to expand? It seems like when we get into earnings season and people hear from CEOs, that starts to become more of a reality. But the further away we then get from that mm. commentary, the more people look at the data coming in, rates in particular. Rates have been such a big driver of markets since November. And again, sentiment has been very bullish. We've seen, if you look at the AI, AAII investor sentiment survey, just that bearishness really collapsed over the last couple yeah. of weeks. So as soon as you get a little bit further away from the micro and the fundamentals, people think about, ooh, rate cut. And, and get a little bit carried uh, away. Carried away. So, what does that mean in terms of volatility? You mentioned that rates are driving everything, and we've seen volatility in bonds certainly um, pick up and surpass what we've seen in equities, where the VIX is really tamped down. How do you see this playing out in 2024 if we get this 2024 framework you talk about? Next year, I think it's a bit of a meet me in the middle type of situation when it comes to volatility, where rate volatility starts to come down. You have the Fed pause. Maybe you see some modest cuts. And that stability in the outlook helps to bring some of that rate volatility down. On the other hand, as you mentioned, the VIX has been incredibly low, has had some really long stretches below 13%, 13 this year. And so we, we potentially start to see that just even get back to average levels. And therefore, you see those two converge a little bit more. I am curious about opportunities outside the U.S. I feel like everyone says the U.S. is the place to be, but you have certain markets in Europe that are doing well. The DAX basically at a record high. You have markets in Japan that I think have defied a lot of expectations. I mean, the Nikkei up 24, 25 percent in a year where I think most people thought it would actually be down uh, on the year here. Is there a compelling case to, I guess, look beyond the U.S. in 2024? The longevity outside mm -hmm. the U.S., first of all, is Partly a valuation story where we've just seen, again, valuations and multiples expand so much in the U.S. Where can we find some favorable relative valuations? Mm -hmm. But then if you think about some of the growth stories abroad, I'd perhaps be a little bit more cautious on areas like Europe and China. Mm -hmm. uh, China might see a bit of a sentiment rally next year, actually, yeah. because we're seeing some stabilization in data. But the structural property issues are probably going to continue to weigh on it. Uh, I think we would le lean more towards areas like Japan, where you're continuing to see corporate recovery and corporate reform play out, mm -hmm. buyback activity and also industrial policy. You're seeing that not only in Japan, but also in places like India, mm -hmm. where the growth rates have just been phenomenal yeah. from a, an economic perspective. What, you, yeah, what did you make all the hype around India? Like when Modi came here to the U.S., remember everyone said, this is it, this is like the new China, and it appeared a lot of investors did try to move their money there. The market, though, is it investable in the sense of accessibility right now for non-Indian uh, non investors? There can yeah. be challenges, and what you do see is a little bit of capriciousness sometimes mm. in terms of the bureaucracy and regulation that has burned investors in the past. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we have to be a little bit careful about uh, investing overseas where there might be government policy that mm -hmm. uh, can, can change a little bit on a dime. Yeah. But the growth rates are there from an economic perspective. From a return on equity perspective, you're seeing those types of th that type of quality. And then the workforce and the demographics in the long yeah. run are pretty unparalleled compared to other parts of the world. And industrial policy, people talk a big talk, but you've seen the walk there, not only on the digital side, but on, on physical infrastructure as well. What about the opportunity to just find value at home? I'm thinking about small caps, which um, really did not have a very good year up until recently when people decided, oh, maybe there's some value to be found here if the Fed is going to indeed stop raising interest rates. 
from a value perspective, there, there is when we think about valuations, because the valuations relative to history are still very discounted, valuations relative to their dynamics with large cap look good. But I think the problem is if we get to a slower economy next year and small caps are so levered to the domestic economy, that's going to hit those revenues. I still think some of the areas of margin pressure are particularly acute in small cap, notably if we think about interest costs. Because if we look at the debt outstanding of the S&P 500 versus the Russell 2000, you can see about 38% of outstanding debt on the Russell 2000 is floating rate versus about 7% in the S&P yeah, 500. So when we think about what's fixed out for longer, uh, the, the vulnerability there more immediately from rising rates probably going to come to small caps. Even if we see modest cuts, it's still that higher for longer environment. Yeah, interesting. I guess a lot of people are already trying to chase trace, chase that trade. Amira, always great to talk to you. Amira Pandit, J.P. Morgan Asset Management's global market strategist, helping us count down uh, to the closing bells, which are just about uh, two minutes or so away. Uh, the fractional gains on the major markets here in the U.S. now actually picking up just a little bit as we get closer to the close. Stick with us. Our full market coverage right here on Bloomberg starts as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with John Tucker, with Molly Smith in today for Tim Stenevik and Carol Masser. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms here on a Monday afternoon. Hello to you too, John and Molly Smith. Yeah, she well, just called you, me a curmudgeon, I, by the way. I did, did not. That was fully John setting me up to corroborate oh. that he has long been a curmudgeon. <laughs> no, I accept that. I accept that criticism. <laughs> That's just like, okay. Well, we've been struggling here a little bit this afternoon, confusing Cincinnati and Cleveland, but we're, we're getting back on track <laughs> Molly here. Molly called it the Windy City, there. Cleveland. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Molly. I know. How dare you? It's a tough day. It's Monday. Oh. It's Monday. Okay. Yeah. Did you guys ch chat markets in there, or are you just talking about Cleveland and Cincinnati? <laughs> uh, some markets, too. Yeah, why not? What? The Fed, CPI. <laughs> Nothing's going on. No, nah, whatever. <laughs> Good to be self-aware, John Tucker. Oh, <laughs> and, and we were also talking about the Golden Globes, uh, Scarlet Foo, and you know what? They don't have a host for the shows, do they? You know, I, I think they did away with that for a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm not clear how on How do you have an award show without forward. hosts? Well, how do you have an awards show with, which has come under so much pressure lately? Well, hopefully they'll get their hosts together here. In fact, uh, I mean, you know, look, if they want anyone to watch this thing, you got to have somebody dangle someone out there. Anyway, we go back uh, to the markets here as we are 30 seconds away from the closing bell. Uh, and we talk about 10 of the 11 S&P sectors solidly in the green. And we talk about a six-week rally that may not have been the most phenomenal rally in the world, but it is six straight weeks of gains. And at least we're starting off here in week seven on a higher note with 390 plus members of the S&P. 500 in the green here on the day, despite the fact that we didn't get any help out of the Magnificent Seven today. And yes, this is actually what I think a lot of folks want to see. A Dow Jones Industrial Average going to close out the day higher by more than 150 points or about four tenths of a percent. A similar percentage move for the S&P 500, which is back above that 4,600 level. A Nasdaq Composite up about 28, 29 points or two tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000 participating as well up about two-tenths of a percent on the day. Yeah, a broadening out of the rally within the S&P 500, 390 stocks higher, 109 stocks lower. Let's just take a look at the sector performances here. You mentioned out of 11 industry groups, 10 are higher. If you break it down into 24 chip companies, consumer services, that's hotels and casino companies, and consumer durable and apparel are up by at least 1.4 percent. On the downside, autos, media, and telecom stocks are lower by at least nine-tenths of one percent. Yeah, let's take a look at some of the uh, individual movers here. The biggest gainer in the S&P 500. That involves Cigna, and that was on the back of a report uh, saying that the previous reports of Cigna would actually buy Humana, that that deal is now off. We're told basically that they could not come to terms uh, on a price. We should point out all of this is based on people familiar with the situation, and the companies haven't confirmed that the deal is off. They never even confirmed that a deal was on in the first place. Meanwhile, Macy is also moving higher here uh, on the day, and that's on the back of what we're learning is of two private uh, equity firms apparently in talk right now uh, to take the company private. We're told that this is actually has a lot more to do with Macy's real estate assets 
assets rather than the actual retail business itself. But this has been a long time uh, in the making in terms of discussions about whether Macy's actually would move to sell. Uh, at least investors seem to think maybe there is some substance to this. So shares up 19 percent here on the day. And take a look at FedEx, an interesting move in FedEx. The gains on the day relatively modest compared to what we're seeing on Macy's here. And actually, sorry, Macy's actually closing lower on the day here, a moving lower down by about three tenths of a percent. I'm pulling a Carol Massa here on the day. But let's see if my next uh, mover has actually managed to stay in the green on the day. That and that was Skyworks. Skyworks uh, did finish in the day nice. up about three percent here on the day. Uh, that's a 10th straight day of gains uh, for the Apple supplier. Uh, longest daily win streak Charlotte, going back to 1980. 84. All right, let's do a quick check of the decliners here. The biggest decliner in the S&P 500 was Paramount giving back some of Friday's 12% surge on the back of reports that outside buyers are interested in buying the streamer. The New York Times reports that Shari Redstone uh, is in talks to sell a controlling stake in National Amusements, the parent company, and has held talks with Skydance. You can see Paramount lower by 3.6%. Coinbase. And in fact, all of these crypto related companies are declining as Bitcoin drops for a third day, falling below $42,000. We're talking Marathon Digital, MicroStrategy, Riot Platforms, all in the red at the moment. And the flip side to that Cigna story remain is Humana, down after Cigna walking away from those talks to acquire the company. Uh, apparently, the gap between what Cigna was willing to pay and what Humana expected was too wide. Yeah, absolutely. Here, interesting flip-flop, and you see how investors are reacting to that. Let's take a look at the reaction that we saw uh, in uh, the yield space here on the day. Uh, the, once again, most of the volatility was in Treasuries, and most of it was on the shorter end of the curve with that Fed-sensitive two-year rate at one point hitting more than 4.77 on the day. But as you can see on your screen, it did manage to drop by the time we got to the close down uh, back around that 471 level, as a lot of people now really focus in on a big data point tomorrow with C. CPI and, of course, a big Fed decision, and more importantly, a big day for Fed communication on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, that's right. I mean, 471, think about, I mean, what was it, in October that we were up around the 5% level on the 10-year? So really a dramatic move down in these recent weeks as people are really just pricing in these uh, more aggressive Fed cuts. Um, who knows? I mean, I think, you know, Wednesday, but Powell's probably going to be really hesitant to really allude to the cut story, probably going to have to weave it in somehow. But then what do you do if are we still retaining that option to hike? It's kind of a lot to manage for him, John. Yeah, I missed out on 5%, but I got to wonder, is 471, is that still a screaming buy at this point? I don't but know if knows? it's screaming, but um, I mean, certainly better than where the 10-year was heading into all this. Hey, yeah. One of the things we're going to take a deeper dive into coming up on radio, at least, the shale boom, you know, it started with a land grab. That phase is pretty much over. So now if you uh, want a seat at the table, you have to make an acquisition. So the street seems to be welcoming news that Occidental is buying a driller, uh, Crown Rock, that's worth somewhere around $11 billion. And it looks like investors are applauding that one. Yeah, it'll yeah. Be interesting. Yeah, go ahead, Scarlett. No, I was just going to say, it feels like there's a big rush to get a lot of M&A done uh, in the next week or so before people take off for the holidays. These are all deals that probably were in the making for weeks or months at a time. And it's just interesting to see that the energy space has really exploded with all this, all these transactions. Yeah, well, I mean, they've pretty much tapped out in the shale. So at this point, it is pretty much about consolidation. And think about how many deals we've seen in that space this year. And of course, Occidental has been one of the more acquisitive companies. So we'll see whether they can pull this off. We had this conversation earlier about this idea as to whether it was a good buy and at least the consensus among our guests seemed to be that they think so. Guess what, guys? It's earnings season still, <laughs> believe it or not. Oracle actually out with earnings oh, right now. Close, That's yeah. crossing the wire. I know you're excited for this, John. Uh, 2Q revenue uh, coming in uh, pretty much, uh, Alexa, a little bit less uh, than what the street was expecting. $12.9 billion. Street was looking for $13.05, for, so a very modest miss. EPS, uh, a very modest beat to the upside, 134 versus a street estimate of 133 And it's interesting, too, because the cloud revenue numbers that they're now breaking out as separate, they did actually show about 12% growth year over year uh, on that basis. So the revenue did come in a little bit less than uh, expectations. 4.8 on that 2Q cloud business when you exclude some estimate, so exclude some metrics. Uh, the street was looking for 4.86. And notably, Oracle also maintains its quarterly dividend at 40 cents a share. We know that in the last couple of months, it's been in kind of a, I would call it cost savings mode, some muted hiring, some pullback in marketing expenses, as uh, the cloud unit was a little bit slow uh, for this past quarter. At least uh, that was the indication given uh, last time around.
Yeah, absolutely here. And it gets to this idea kind of when we start talking about uh, business spending and that pillar of the economy. We were speaking with Ellen Zentner a little bit earlier, and she was really banging this drum about the consumer side of the economy and how there's enough evidence there that it hold up. And it gets back, I think, uh, to one of the questions I can't remember with Scarlett or Molly you brought up, but about this idea of sort of uh, what the Fed does next, whether a 4-7 is a screaming buy. Yeah, it's a screaming buy if you think that rates are going to come down. And Ellen Zentner seems to make it clear, at least in her view and in the House view, they're over at Morgan Stanley, we're going to see multiple rate cuts, and it's not going to be because of a recession. It's this idea that when you're following the Taylor rule and you're following some of those other metrics, as inflation comes down, you need to adjust restrictive policy in line with that. And that, in her view, is what those rate cuts are going to represent. And that really is the majority of opinions right now. We just had a Bloomberg survey earlier this month as to why the Fed is going to cut rates. Nearly three quarters of economists said it's just for that reason, and remain that Zentner is in the camp of that inflation is going to be easing and that's going to warrant a lower policy rate. But you've still got this minority camp of 28 or so percent of economists who say it's going to be due to recession. Um, our Bloomberg economics team being in that camp, but increasingly seems to really be a minority well, view let, out there. Well, let me just ask you this, so, and it opposes to and Scarlett, I, I want you to weigh in because when we talk about a 5-5 five, five Fed funds rate and you're now looking basically across the entire curve right now, well below five with a 10 year down all the way down to four, two and a two year at four, seven. Doesn't that tell you that a 5-5 five, five is just too much? Perhaps. I, it, it goes back to this interesting situation where Jay Powell praised the fact that uh, financial conditions had tightened and maybe that suggested policy was restrictive enough. And as soon as he said that, of course, everything unwound. So have we gone too far in the unwinding direction? It seems like it's OK at the moment, but um, we'll have to see after CPI and, and on Wednesday. All right. Yeah. Fed, Schmed, Data, Schmeda. Uh, yeah. It looks like in the Bloomberg MLI poll survey that the majority of investors see the S&P 500 hitting a record in 2024. Well, we'll see if that plays out. That does it for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. And a reminder that Bloomberg Business Week is also on Bloomberg Originals. We'll be back with our radio colleagues tomorrow at the same time and same place with our global simulcast. And we continue our coverage here on Bloomberg Television to deeper dive into some of those results that we just got out of Oracle. That's coming up next on The Close. This is Bloomberg. Coming off six straight weeks of gains for the broader markets here in the U.S. and starting off week seven on a relatively positive note here. The S&P 500 pushing past that 4,600 mark, but a lot of people say there's a lot more room for this rally to run. In fact, most of the estimates coming in for 2024, while the average is right around that kind of 4,750, 4,800 range, a lot of folks really see 5,000 in the cards with a couple of folks all the way up around that 5,200 level. So what gets us there? Is it going to be the Magnificent Seven or is it going to be a broadening out of this rally? We did get that broadening, at least here on this Monday afternoon. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, that was actually uh, the biggest gainer, at least among the big sectors out there here. 3.4% gain, actually pushing the index back to its highest level since January here. So we're setting up potentially for fresh year-to-date highs for the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index if it can continue rallying here over the next few days and a couple of weeks. Dow Transports were also a big outperformer, 1.2% here on the day. Meanwhile, gold continues to slide. That's largely on the back of expectations that not only is the Fed done, but those rate hikes being priced into the market. Well, that could come sooner rather than later. But whether those rate cuts come because the Fed is trying to normalize policy or whether they're cutting because of economic conditions, keep an eye on what's going on in the commodity space. The Bloomberg Commodity Index starting off the week down once again, and this has been the trend line now. We're now back down to the lowest levels on this index since, uh, I believe, late 2021. So keep an eye on that space. The dollar really did not a whole lot of anything. And while there was a lot of volatility today, Scarlett, in the Treasury space, the net effect of it all, we're still pretty much where we've been for the last couple of days. That could change, of course, over the next two days with that CPI report tomorrow and the Fed decision on Wednesday. Yeah, there might be a lot of moves in uh, Treasury yields, but right now they're little changed uh, in terms of the actual direction. All right, let's get out. Let's move along to Oracle because those were 
results came out just a few moments ago, and the stock is falling in after hours trading. I want to bring in Anurag Rana, our Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst, uh, to go through some of the numbers. And of course, Oracle reported fiscal second quarter adjusted revenue that missed analyst estimates. But I want to ask you about Oracle cloud infrastructure, because within the results, I can see that the cloud infrastructure revenue rose 60 percent year over year. Is this a business that's kind of in the same league as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud, or is it breaking into that league? Uh, it's much smaller than that, which is why the growth rates are much higher. But over time, I think they will have a cloud offering or they will have a cloud revenue that is going to be much bigger than uh, than this. But I don't think they're going to catch up to either Amazon or Microsoft anytime in the near term. In fact, I don't think that's going to be possible just because of the, 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 the two different businesses these guys are in. So what is the growth story, if there is one at all? Well, the growth story is that, you know, for a long period of time, Oracle was growing into that 4 or 5% range. And in the last couple of quarters, we saw that growth rate, you know, take up around the 7 8% mark. Now, this quarter is an aberration. It's, it, or the growth rate was only 4% in constant currency. And I think on the conference call, it is going to be very important for them to come out and say that growth is going to pick up over the next couple of quarters. Um, otherwise, it's not going to be good uh, you know, news for the investors, frankly. When we talk about competition here, I mean, I know they're traditional competitors. Is that still the main threat? Or are we now looking at kind of this new cohort of uh, a software a company, software names uh, as the real ones that they need to watch? See, Oracle's core competitors are still the same, you know, Microsoft, SAP, AWS. But, you know, frankly speaking, right now they are really making a big push, largely because they have the dollars to support it, that they can be an alternative cloud provider to vendors who are struggling to find, you know, AI workloads either being hosted in Microsoft or anywhere else. So from that point, Oracle's done a good job about it. But, you know, just like what we saw, the reason why the stock is down is because their cloud infrastructure growth came in below what analysts were expecting. And I think they'll have to come back again on the call and explain why that's the case and should we expect an improvement over the next 12 months. You know, as we look for any kind of growth catalyst for Oracle, in the past, it would have just bought another company. Where is Oracle with that, with this serial acquisition identity? Is it still able to do that with rates the way where they are? See, they recently acquired a company called Cerner, so I don't think they're going to have a big acquisition in the near term. I don't think for the next, at least next couple of years that's not going to happen. In fact, Cerner is one of the reasons why their growth decelerated this quarter, uh, Cerner going through some cloud transition itself. Um, that has been a factor for uh, Oracle to report you know, compressed sales, and I think that's also going to be important to see whether that kind of trend continues or can we see a rebound over there. All right, Anur Agrana always um, giving us a smart analysis on uh, the software companies he covers. Anur Agrana of Bloomberg Intelligence on Oracle shares falling in after hours trading. Meanwhile, Bloomberg has learned that General Atlantic has confidentially filed for an IPO. The growth equity firm is known for its investments, including Facebook and Airbnb. So we wanted to bring in Bloomberg deals reporter Ryan Gould for more. Ryan, um, I, you had mentioned that this is something General Atlantic had considered doing, filing for an IPO, but this comes on the heels of other investment firms doing the same. Yeah, it's part of a trend, I would say, of, you know, we've heard a lot about the need for a one-stop shop in alternative asset management. We've seen the likes of HPS, who, you know, Bloomberg has reported in the past couple of weeks, had filed uh, more than a year ago for an IPO confidentially. Um, you know, we've seen this with Blue Owl. We've seen it with, with um, Aries as well, this desire that you really just want to get out there and have investors really just target one source of, you know, maybe just being a jack of all trades. If you want private equity, you can go to this firm. If you want to do private credit, you can go to this firm. And everyone does the same, does the same thing. And hopefully the, in, the hope being that investors will follow. Um, but, you know, for General Atlantic, it is obviously quite a storied name in growth equity. Uh, it is thinking about doing something as soon as next year. But then again, uh, as with the IPO market warming and fits and starts, it could yeah. decide to do nothing at all. What's the benefit of filing confidentially for an IPO if it doesn't actually know whether it's going to follow through with, with doing so? I think, you know, people talk a lot to me, uh, you know, the bankers in the ECM world talk a lot about having the optionality to do something. What that actually translates to is probably not a lot. Mm. Uh, it just means that, okay, well, if we spot a, a good window, let's say we get to the first quarter, the end of the first quarter next, next year, and we suddenly see, you know, five or six IPOs in a week, you're going to be looking over your shoulder and thinking, well, okay, uh, what does this look like vis-a-vis -vis where we might end up in the second quarter for the election and so on? I'd say that's still a big point for next year because we've covered a lot of companies outside of the alternative asset management space looking to IPO. 
which are obviously, you know, wrangling with the idea of missing out on potentially the post Labor Day window. Uh, but I am curious as to, to the real sort of thrust behind this. I mean, obviously, there's obviously a lot of a potential windfall that comes with that. But there's also a lot of, I guess, scrutiny that comes with being a public company. And I would think that with the type of bets that General Atlantic makes, which let's face it, a lot of them are, uh, you know, long shots, if, if you will, here, whether the scrutiny that they're going to have on a quarter to quarter basis is going to match up with their effectively longer term bets. I think you're right, Romain. It's an upside and downside yeah. assessment, just because if you think about just private equity in general, I mean, profitability has now become king and growth has sort of been put in the rear view somewhat. Um, there is maybe a little bit of an expectation next year that that could rebalance somewhat. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think you're right. You know, you are putting yourself out there uh, for more yeah. scrutiny. It's something you have to get more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I think as we kind of learn from the SPAC wave, um, you know, which didn't really, you know, do, do fare too well in terms of estimates and projections and so on. You know, you are setting ourselves up to be in a position where you could be in the hot seat. So, yeah. So what do we know? I mean, just to kind of close the loop for us here about the ability for this uh, to actually come to market. I mean, I know this is just really them testing the waters here, but you think that or at least based on your reporting, you think that there is going to be enough support for this? Um, it's hard to say, I'd say, in terms of how much support, how much demand. It's a question, right, that, you know, you're going to be dealing with. If you, if you have good advice, it's the way you pay for good advice, right? It's, uh, you know, you would have to get to a point where you'd say this is the robust market. We think that investors get behind our, our platform, really. What we're looking to do in General Atlantic's case is a growth investor. Mm -hmm. But I would also just round it up by saying that this year we were meant to see CVC Capital, uh, a big buyout firm, you know, known for its private equity bets with over $160 billion AUM. Uh, IPO. That looked like a sure bet for an Amsterdam listing as recently as the autumn. Yeah. And now we're at a place where, you know, that's been put on ice. So who's to say? All right, uh, Ryan. Well, uh, we're going to have you back on to say uh, when it uh, happens or doesn't happen. Ryan Gould uh, covering this story for us. Uh, stick with us. Coming up a little bit later on The Clothe, the sit down with the co-founders and CEOs of a company called Asuzu. It's about a platform and how it strives to boost the financial well-being of renters. That conversation coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Is it time for the Timo takeover? PDD, better known as Pinduoduo, Duo, discounts as a discount app called Timo, which has been generating lots of buzz in China, even gunning for the likes of Amazon and Walmart in the U.S. On Bloomberg's latest Big Take, we take a look at how the company behind this addictive app is outpacing Jack Ma's Alibaba and even earning his praise. Bloomberg Spencer Soper joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And uh, Timo just seems to be everywhere now. I, I remember when I first kind of started popping up in my email and I started seeing ads. I had no idea what it was. And I didn't even realize that it was linked to uh, PDD uh, and that whole sort of China e-commerce uh, e ecosystem. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people are clicking through on the on the origin story. Um, but yeah, it just kind of came out of nowhere in the U.S. And over the past year has, you know, racked up billions in sales and a lot of it just by word of mouth and friend referrals and enticing people to send their friend a, co friend a code and encourage them to download the app. And then they had their big Super Bowl commercial where they told everyone they could shop like a billionaire on Timu. Yeah, I remember that here. I did not shop like a billionaire uh, on Timu, but there are a lot of people who use it. And I've heard more and more people, Spencer, here in the U.S. talk about you know, who were Prime members, who were buying from Target and Walmart, saying now they're relying a lot more on Timu. Is this real? Is there real data to back that up? Yeah, there's definitely real data that people are, are using it and at least trying it, right? And so that's kind of what we're waiting to see. Then it, can, they, can they turn the corner and turn, you know, curious uh, looky-loos and people that want to get a one-time deep discount on something into, into loyal shoppers, which is really what Amazon's really cemented, you know, just having th those... Uh, you know, I think it's like three fourths of every U.S. household is a member of Prime and goes there regularly. You know, can Timu uh, prove itself sticky, not just a, a one hit wonder? Could it could Timu prove itself sticky? I mean, did Alibaba ever really get cemented in the American consumer's consciousness the way that um, Timu we're saying that Timu could have the potential to do so? 
Alibaba, it was several years ago. I, I can't even remember precisely when. They tried something. They had like an online marketplace. It didn't have the Alibaba name attached to it. And they, they almost gave up on it as soon as they tried. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't put a lot of money or time or energy into it. So Timu definitely seems to be putting a lot more capital uh, and, and, and marketing budget. And certainly so far ha has done a lot better than, than Alibaba ever did in the U.S. So given that, how are companies like Amazon, like Walmart, Walmart responding to Timu coming in? Well, the, the, the most recent thing we've seen um, Amazon do in response to some of this pressure from Chinese-based companies or Chinese-linked companies was lowering commissions on, uh, on apparel retailers. And they're really going, that was seen largely as a, you know, going after, after Shein, but also Timu, trying to entice more merchants to hit those low price points, like you know, $15 or less or $20 or less on apparel. So they do have some knobs they can turn to try to make their prices more more competitive, and they're cer certainly reacting. Uh, talk to us a little bit here uh, about uh, the head of this company, uh, I mean, Colin uh, Wang, if I'm pronouncing it right. And I think it's interesting because we talk about the connection with Jack Ma, or at least uh, Jack Ma's sort of affinity for what this company has managed to do. And I do wonder how he avoids, to a certain extent, maybe uh, I guess the fate of Jack Ma, who has kind of been kind of pushed out after he maybe got a little bit too successful and a little bit too big for his britches. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, a very important distinction. Um, it, Jack Ma was kind of like almost like this rock star celebrity status in China's tech world and has really been kind of put in a corner uh, by the Chinese government and even to the extent of, of fines and, and sanctions. So uh, now you have someone coming in, maintaining a much lower profile, making sure that the marketing of the company, at least in China, aligns with kind of the, the, the Chinese government message um, and also kind of making inroads with the with the lower tier cities and trying to uh, promote promote these discounts as being good good for the country. All right, a great story here uh, on the Bloomberg terminal. It is our Bloomberg big take. Jack Ma's top e-commerce rival is coming for Amazon. Spencer Soper, one of the reporters on that byline. Stick with us here on the close as we set you up for what's going to be a big week for macro data. That CPI report coming out tomorrow. Gene Ludwig, chairman of the Ludwig Institute for Shared Economic Prosperity. He'll be giving us his take in just a second. This is Bloomberg. The S&P holding that line at 4,600 as a lot of uh, strategist targets for 2024 start to come in, and most of them are actually above 4,600, some as high as 5,200. But what is going to be the next catalyst here on this Monday afternoon and what is really shaping up to probably be one of the last more meaningful weeks of the trading year? Fractional gains in stocks on this day, uh, fractional price gains on short dated treasuries, fractional gains on things like commodities, fractional gains on the dollar. It's a bit of a holding pattern right now as everyone really is waiting to hear what Jay Powell and company have to say on Wednesday with that latest rate decision, the release of the dot plot, and more importantly, the commentary that the Jay Powell is willing to feed this market. Of course, that commentary, in theory, should be dependent on the data and some big data set to drop tomorrow, Scarlett here in the U.S. You said it, Romain. The latest read on inflation will be coming out tomorrow morning for a preview of what we might expect. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, who's been looking through the Economist forecast. Abigail? One thing that strikes me as interesting here, Scarlett, is that we're so focused on the FOMC that uh, the CPI report to some degree is being buried. But I think that that's also because CPI inflation has been, mo been moving in the right direction for many months. So relative to uh, CPI for the month of November, the expectation is the headline number is expected to decline to 3.1 percent from 3.2 percent. So not a lot of drama there. Core, though, is expected to stay higher at 4 percent. There is some sense that if these numbers come in right around line, in line, if we're flat, that this may give the Fed the green light to come cut in the first half of next year. Let's wait to see what the Fed has to say about that, of course. What's really interesting, if we really dig below the surface on CPI, this chart is a great one. So back in the summer of 2022, that was the peak of CPI, uh, right about, I think it was like 9.1% or there, thereabouts. 
In terms of the breakdown, in white, we're looking at core services. In blue, we are looking at, let me just take a look, food. In purple, that's core, that is core core. And then in orange, uh, we have energy. So energy is one thing that's been taking pressure off of inflation, and that would certainly seem to be the case uh, in the month of November as well, with the tremendous volatility for uh, oil and some of the other areas of the energy complex. But Romaine, let's tie this back together with the Fed, because here's CPI, here's the two-year yield, and then here's the Fed target rate. And you can see a massive, massive gap. The question is, will the Fed be signaling that they're staying higher for longer, even if we do stay flat or if it were to decline? And what happens if it actually goes higher? All eyes on tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Yeah, certainly uh, going to be a big uh, event here. And of course, the market really has to parse not only the data that we're getting, but more importantly, whether it's a true reflection of what we're seeing in the economy. Joining us for more is Gene Ludwig. He is the chairman of the Ludwig Institute for shared economic prosperity. It's also a former comptroller for the currency uh, here in the U.S. Uh, back in the 90s and uh, has done a lot in between those. Uh, a real uh, student here uh, of markets and the economy. And I am curious, Gene, about some of these numbers that we obsess over, the data that we obsess over, and whether it really is giving us an accurate read on where inflation is, or more importantly, where people feel inflation is. You and Scarlett, uh, uh, happy holidays. Uh, sadly, our headline statistics do not really reflect uh, what people are feeling and, uh, and what the real numbers are. Uh, the headline statistics were uh, defined back in the 1930s from concepts of the 1880s. And I find them, and our institute finds them terribly misleading, particularly with regard to middle and low income Americans, which is our, our concern. So what's the sort of, I guess, solution, if you will, Gene? If we're not getting maybe the best reflection of that here, how do we then make assessments as to things like where monetary policy should go or where fiscal policy should go? Well, it's very hard. And one of the core focuses for our institute is that we change these uh, headline statistics so they're more in line with what America really needs and policy leaders really need to assess the economy. As you know, uh, we've taken a very hard look at, at uh, the unemployment uh, data, at the CPI, et cetera. And it, you know, it's time that we made a change in these headline statistics. Absolutely. So I'm curious, when we talk about the informal economy and this idea that there are a lot of people who are forced to get side gigs or other jobs that um, aren't formally counted, do we have any sense of how big it is? What's the size and scale of it? And I ask because if we're not including data on it, I want to get a sense of what we're not including. Well, Scarlett, that's a wonderful question. It is exactly why we started to look at the informal economy to see whether or not that was an ingredient here that really helped middle and low income Americans. It wasn't being really tracked. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually a fairly large number, generally speaking. It's about 8.5%. Uh, that's what the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund puts it at. Uh, of the uh, of GDP, but in terms of middle and low income Americans, uh, it's it's really actually trivial. You're not going to make all that money on your side gig and a substitute for a real living wage job. Uh, yes, you can buy some Christmas presents and you know it helps a little bit, but it, it's not core. Interesting. Okay, 8.5 percent of GDP. Um, what? What do we know then about the impact of this informal economy on wages, the wages that we do count, the wages that the Federal Reserve does track in determining what inflation looks like? Well, as we've tracked it for middle and low income Americans, it might change our numbers, you know, 1 percent. But still, the sad number is that 23 percent of Americans are functionally unemployed today. It isn't 3.8 percent in terms of unemployment. That that is a bogus way to look at the uh, at the economy. For, if whether uh, functionally unemployed for us means you can't earn above a poverty wage, you can't get a full time job, and you really want one. Um, uh, if you can't do that, then we count you as functionally unemployed. And the number of 23 percent is a huge yeah. number. 
I, I am curious as to sort of what brings people into the into the light, if you will, Gene, and uh, converts uh, the opposite of that as well. What pushes them into the dark? This idea that you always have had, at least in my lifetime, you've always had a certain segment of the population that kind of had to operate in the shadows for a wide variety of reasons. And I'm curious, do good economic uh, economic times like we had really for several years here, does that pull more people into the sunlight or, or does it have the opposite effect? I think it pu pulls more people into the sunlight. Uh, that's my intuitive sense. Uh, uh, so, you know, a uh, rising tide lifts all boats. But unfortunately, the rising tide in America, while that's a good thing, hasn't uh, lifted enough boats. Middle and low income Americans uh, have not been doing as well for the last 20 years uh, as they need to to keep pace with the economy. Actually, wages have declined for, for that huge segment of our population. Mm -hmm. I'm curious also how immigration plays into this as well, because we've seen a drop off in immigration to this country. Um, so does that then therefore have any effect on the way? I mean, it doesn't it certainly has an effect on the availability of work. But what does it mean in terms of wages? Well, historically, diversity and immigration has been the core for uh, the development of the U.S. economy. Uh, uh, cutting it off, I'm very dubious about. I, I think the issue here is really sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to be a society that shares a bit more for middle and low income Americans, maybe a lot more. And we've also got to be a society that is as dynamic as possible to produce real living wage jobs for our people. All right, Gene, going to have to leave it there. Always appreciate talking to you. Gene Ludwig over at Ludwig Advisors here. A closer look here at the more informal aspects of our economy and how that feeds into the economic data and more importantly, some of the big monetary policy decisions. Coming up, a conversation with the co-founders and co-CEOs of Asuzo. It's a rental platform that helps people build their credit records. They're gonna be joining us in just a second. This is Bloomberg. Decides. We're talking rates. We're talking inflation. Without a recession, that's the good stuff. Will officials pause as expected? We're heading into the end of the year. We're in a soft landing right now. Will they put rate cuts on the table for 2024? It remains to be seen. The data will dictate that. Trust Bloomberg for the fastest coverage and exclusive analysis. Everything was hedged. They're going to have to have a good reason to do whatever. Bloomberg Surveillance. The Fed Decides. Wednesday on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close, a focus now on innovation in financial technology. Isuzu is a platform that reports on-time rent payments to major credit bureaus. It's part of an effort to help renters improve their credit scores. And last year, it became one of the few black-owned startups to reach a unicorn valuation of $1 billion. Joining us now for an exclusive interview are the co-founders and co-CEOs of Asuzu, uh, Abe Wamimo and Samir Goyle. They've just released new data from their year in review, along with the launch of their new resident portal. Samir, great to have you, as well as Abe, great to have you back on the program as well. And I do want to start off with that data, because I think the last time we spoke, we spoke a lot about how renters are actually using the app to build credit scores, something that in the past a lot of people forget here in the U.S., you didn't really do. You paid your rent and it just kind of went into a black hole and didn't affect your credit score. Did, have you seen in the data a material improvement uh, in the credit scores of people who use the platform? Yes. Thanks a lot for having mm -hmm. us back, Romain. Um, as you know, renters send over $1.44 trillion to their landlords every year. Mm -hmm. And that's significant. So what we've seen, particularly from reporting on-time rental payments data is we've seen it, that's a six points increase in credit scores. Mm -hmm. One thing we're particularly excited about is we've been able to unlock over $21.7 billion in economic activities. $14 billion of that are mortgages yeah. that otherwise folks won't have access to and an additional 
$7 billion um, or so um, in other loans and credit cards. So something we're very, very proud and excited about. So sorry, expand on that a little bit. So you, when you say unlocking economic activity, the idea is that as those credit scores improve, they have more economic capital either to borrow or do other things, and you're saying that that adds to the economic activity? Precisely. So okay. this consumers, otherwise, they would not be able to get access to a mortgage because mm -hmm. they are subprime. Mm -hmm. um, consumers, mm -hmm. and through ASUSU, by reporting on their on-time rental payment data, establishing their credit scores for the first time or building it, mm -hmm. now they've been able to unlock mortgages, auto loans, things like affordable credit cards and student loans. So that's where we got that mm -hmm. $21 billion from. Well, let me bring you into the conversation, Samir. Um, you report these on-time rent payments to major credit bureaus. What was that process like to get them involved? I can't imagine that it was easy, given that they're so entrenched in doing things their way, whether we're talking about TransUnion, uh, Equifax, or Experian. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So fortunately, we do work with all three of the credit bureaus, and I like to call it purposeful pain. So it certainly wasn't an easy process to partner with them, but in all honesty, that's their prerogative because they are ultimately the bearers of truth as we think about it in our system. And the argument that we made to the credit bureaus to get them to partner with us was, today we're operating in a world where we treat you like you're guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. But if we use alternative data, things like rental payments that are really great indicators of trustworthiness and predictive, we can be more inclusive and intentional in our system, but you can still achieve your outcome, which is predictive risk and helping lenders make intelligent decisions. And I wonder whether landlords were part of this process as well. Um, oftentimes the big landlords or companies, uh, were they going to the credit uh, agencies and saying, you know, this is information that is helpful because we look at it in this particular way? Absolutely. We call our platform the ultimate win-win-win. Renters obviously benefit because they can build and establish credit. But for landlords, it's also a reason for their renters to pay on time. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that excites them and makes them want to see this data reflected, especially because they look at credit reports for things like screening, right? And if it doesn't even include whether or not someone pays their rent, then they're missing a critical piece of data. And so landlords were excited, the credit bureaus were excited, and lastly, regulators were really excited because helping people build and establish credit ultimately yeah. drives economic opportunity. You also have a partnership with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. How yeah. does that work? I'm glad you asked. That's mm -hmm. been a terrific partnership for us. We've been working with both the government-sponsored entities for about two years. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is institute a novel program where they'll cover the cost of Asusu's platform mm -hmm. for any owner or operator that has real estate assets financed through either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do is ultimately tie it to their goals for equity and multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. They realize that if they can help renters build and establish credit, one day they can move towards that proverbial American dream and become homeowners. I am curious, Abe, about how this business is affected, if at all, by economic conditions. When times get bad, and eventually they will be, that's just the normal cycle of economies and businesses here, how insulated are you from a potential, uh, potential downdraft? I think for us, what we've done is, and we've been very forthright about it, is we've built a business that performs in a downturn. We build a business that really stands with consumers during the time of need. Mm. What Isusu does is simple. When you pay rent, that data reflects on your credit score. And when people don't pay rent, we extend zero interest loans to them. So they are not evicted. And as a society, we're not solving homelessness backwards. Are you taking on the risk, though, from, from by extending them that credit? We are not taking on the okay. risk. Um, we have a unique partner mm. um, called Stable Home Funds, mm. um, a different capital source through a nonprofit institution. And we went to corporations and large institutions that care about homelessness. And we said, when people are already on the streets, what's the point of trying to rehabilitate them where you can actually prevent eviction? Mm -hmm. So we had corporations and family offices and foundations that invested, and now we can lend money to folks at zero interest rates. Mm -hmm. So as a society, we're not solving homelessness backwards and betting on people. What we've learned is people want a fight and chance, not a handout, and that's what we've been able to do at Isuzu. We're in a very interesting situation right now with the housing market in that it's so inaccessible to so many people. It's unaffordable for people who want to buy their first homes. It's unaffordable for people who are looking to rent or renew their uh, rental contracts as well. How are, you able, how are you thinking through in terms of the opportunities as housing becomes more and more out of reach for so many people? You know, what we've seen particularly from an ASUSU perspective is rent continues to go up. But in a high interest rate environment, it's also very expensive to get access to a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Well, one equation we've left out is folks that do not have a credit score. 
There are 45 million people in this country that do not have a credit score. The average debt in the United States is 92,000. If you do that math, we can unlock over $4.1 trillion in market activity. So we always talk about the current issues persisting in the marketplace, but there's a huge opportunity for folks that are not even involved in the economy today. So those folks are the $14 billion in mortgages we've been able to unlock. I'm curious about just the building of the business, uh, Samir. Uh, obviously, this has been, for a lot of private companies, a difficult environment in trying to raise new funds here. Have you gone back to the market in search of new funds? And if so, what was that experience? We have not gone back to the market to raise capital. We like to think about uh, raising money as an opportunistic activity. Mm -hmm. We want to be operating the business intelligently and in a manner that moves towards profitability, so that way we never have to raise money in a bad capital environment, mm -hmm. but rather when there's a good opportunity to raise money. Instead, what we've done is really hunker down on our fiscal discipline, make sure that we're spending prudently, and really invest in innovation and new ideas while the market is a little slower. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're very excited to announce is our resident portal, whereby we're not just reporting rental data to the bureaus, but now we're allowing renters to access financial literacy content, local social services and other tools and resources. And then next year, we're also going to be announcing a large renter rewards program for our renters. And this downturn gave us the opportunity to invest mm -hmm. in those new products. Where does, where does the revenue from that come from? Is that coming from the renters or is that still coming from uh, the, the, the real estate companies that you're partnering with? Yeah, so our standard business yeah. model is $2 per dollar per month, but this also gives us a huge opportunity from an advertising perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you a funny story. My mother, um, mm -hmm. when we, you know, my, when we raised $130 million in financing and I called my mother up and said, hey, you know, we just raised all this money and mind you, she has less than an high school degree. Yeah. You know what my mother told me? What? I was the wedding plan in communism. <laughs> right. She didn't really understand the magnitude and that's yeah. the question that's yeah. been part of our equation at Isusu. Is this question of proximity. We want to make it very, very close to people like my mother and say, if I pay my rent on time, I will get rewards and we're adding innovative way and a contrarian approach that's not otherwise um, used in the marketplace today. So we're really, really excited. Abe, bottom line, I know you're trying to improve the inputs into credit scores, but is the way that we report on credit scores broken overall fundamentally? It is, but the, um, when you think about the marketplace, right, the system treats people like they're guilty onto proven innocence, yeah. right? And we're solving a lot of things backwards. But what we are doing, like the founding fathers of this country asked us to do is to make it more perfect. And particularly from an ISUSU perspective, rental data and other alternative data is now included in folks' credit scores. So by including this particular data point, we believe we can unlock a lot of market opportunities. And I think we're just getting started. All right. Well, you definitely have to keep us uh, updated uh, on your progress uh, for both of you. Our thanks there uh, to Abe Wamimo and Samir Goyle, who are the co-founders and co-CEOs of the fintech company, Asuzu. All right. Coming up here on the program, stick with us. It's going to be a busy week and we're going to set you up for what to watch. That's coming up next here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. All right, we've been telling you it's going to be a busy week, so let's get right to it here. The market's going to have a lot of things they need to parse tomorrow over the next 24 hours. And we start in the morning with some oil market data. Yeah, it comes out at 7 a.m. The latest OPEC oil market report comes out, and it comes, of course, as OPEC's latest moves didn't do much to assuage concerns that there's plenty of supply. And we've seen WTI go from $89 in late September to below $70 last week. Yeah, that's going to be a big one. We're also going to get IEA later this week, as well as the latest uh, out of the U.S. Energy Agency as well on their monthly outlook. Looks. Of course, that brings us to 8.30 a.m. Washington time tomorrow. And Scarlett, we've been talking about it all day. Yeah, the latest or in last data point before Jay Powell and company decide on interest rates and, of course, set their uh, economic projections for the following years. Uh, we have the headline number on a month-over-month -month basis, core, increasing to three-tenths of one percent. And, of course, the year-over-year -year number you want to focus on core, once again, is four percent, staying at a four percent handle. Yeah, I mean, you could talk about super core. You can talk about all <laughs> these other little measures here. Yeah. But you see the trend line there.
there. And of course, that's going to be a big factor, not so much in what they do on Wednesday, but more importantly, what he communicates yes. uh, for the next uh, meetings uh, starting uh, next year here. And then how about a Treasury auction? We had a Treasury auction earlier today. We didn't talk about it a lot of, uh, much today, but it was kind of sloppy. It was kind of sloppy. Yeah. And of course, there was a lot of supply coming this week. You have a 30-year auction, so really long end of the mm -hmm. yield curve, the yeah. longest end. And the timing got moved because of the FOMC. So yeah. it's happening uh, the day right after. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of demand there is for the longest end of the yield curve. Yeah, so the 10-year today, that 30-year though, but we saw most of the activity in the market, at least in the secondary market, certainly on that two-year. Yeah. And the things that I think are most under the purview uh, of the Fed. We're also going to uh, check in on geopolitics here. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is supposed to be here in the U.S. Yeah, he's set to visit Washington. It's a last-ditch effort to try to break this congressional deadlock over funding, uh, military funding, $60 billion worth for his country. Good luck to him because Congress can't agree on anything. Yeah, a bit of a backfire uh, by the Biden administration, which tried to sort of tie yeah. uh, funding for the border with uh, Ukraine funding. And of course, Republicans didn't buy into it. Uh, stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next for all your political news. Meanwhile, for all the market news, Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow right here on The Close, right here on Bloomberg.